I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Folks, welcome back. It's time for that weekly webinar. Dr. James here with my best friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Ezretel. How are we doing? Folks, hello, James. Especially hello to you. Especially hello. All right, guys, so we're going to get right to it. This week we have, no, no, no exaggeration here, about 28 pages of questions. Not just questions, but pages of questions. So Dr. Mike and I are going to auto-regulate how long we feel like going today. So we might go all the way through if it's pretty swift, and we might decide to break it up into a couple episodes if it's kind of long and we have uh, a lot to say on some of the topics. So just a heads up, we're going we're gonna to start with uh, the ones that were submitted generally first and kind of make our way through like we usually do and go from there. Sound good? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Daniel Blink starts us off. Hi, Docs. Just finished watching a hell of a gem. Uh, advanced hypertrophy lecture series. With great pleasure to have some questions. Many of them have possibly no real-life applicability. I'm just looking to deepen my understanding of mechanisms and principles. My apologies for a lot of text. No worries. That's why we're here. Number one, one shouldn't add new exercise in the middle of a meso, but what if it is already in but on a different day? Monday, exercise number one. Exercise number two. Thursday, exercise one, exercise three. Would it be okay at some point to add exercise three to Monday? Is there any advantage to not having exercise number three on Monday from the beginning? Yes, uh, there is. So James and I don't like to add exercises on during the meso because it throws off both your stimulus and recovery to a significant and unpredictable extent, and it can uh, alter the rest of your meso cycle. So for example, if you threw a new exercise in, so you have two questions. One, are you recovered enough to get a lot out of it? from before uh, or have other muscles that you've stimulated before actually precluded you from hitting the target muscle really well? And two, how will recovering from that exercise affect downstream exercises? For example, let's say you have an exercise for tricep extensions that gives you a real big forearm pump. You throw it in on a Tuesday. Well, Monday you trained forearms. It turns out that now on Tuesday doing this new tricep pushdown exercise, you actually uh, it, looks, it looks like your forearms are a limiting factor because they get such a big pump. And then because your forearms get fatigued again, Wednesday you'd normally train forearms again. And a Wednesday forearm workout sucks because you're so tired from Monday and Tuesday. So if you plan all your exercises out ahead of time and know what you know, you know what you're going to recover from, you can get a real good feel for what's going on. If you start throwing in new exercises in the middle of your meso, they can have unpredictable effects. And the thing is, is that in the first week of exercises, if they have weird and strange effects, you can move them around a little bit. You can uh, increase and decrease the volume. All that stuff can be shifted. But if it's the middle of the meso, you're in the momentum phase already where you're ha having good workouts, good workouts. You're tracking MRVs. Everything is just in line. If you throw a new exercise in then, it can really throw everything off and be like, well, did I hit my tricep MRV? Is it really like my forearms are too pumped? And then you can't answer a bunch of questions. So it's a really, really good thing to set a bunch of really good initial conditions and then wiggle them a little bit in the first week and then week two, three, four, five, et cetera. It just uh, coast, go. Uh, and if you mess that up, then it's a big deal, James. Yeah, and I like that you came at the question from a, a question of like exercise variation, which is a good good way of thinking about it, but this is actually a more fundamental problem. And Mike already nailed it, which is just consistency across weeks. So it's not so much that it's the same exercise and there's not an issue of variation. It's the fact that you're just radically, I say radically, but it's like you're making a major shift in your exercise paradigms, which is going to have downstream effects, as, as Mike already said, on recovery and performance. So that's really the issue. So it doesn't really, if it's a new exercise and you're changing it around, that's, that's a twofold problem. In this case, it's just a one-fold problem um, just from the structure, but the consistency is really, really important. I would say way more important than that variation consideration in this, in this particular case. Yeah. Number two, with three times a week training and three exercises for a muscle group, what would be the difference between doing all three exercises on each day, doing only one exercise on each day, doing pairs one plus two, one plus three, two plus three? Troubles with matching volume may arise, but let's say we manage that. Um, well, so um, I think that if you do all three exercises on each day, you run into a problem if you're doing an excessive amount of warming up and getting a feel for stuff. You're using an excessive amount of gym equipment, which is just inconvenience. You're going to have my muscle connection problems. So for example, let's say you do two sets of bench, two sets of incline, and two sets of dips. Like 
only your second and third set of dips and incline and bench are really going to be the, the awesome ones. You, you feel your technique is really crisp. You're really settled in. You're getting great connection. Um, if you have to switch exercises often, it's like every set, every single set you do is kind of really awkward, right? And, and, and there's a counter argument of like, why? So if you're getting really great connection from dips and, and bodybuilders, sometimes even the folks that aren't overly intellectual about this, they'll say, you know, uh, incline bench went so great today. We just kept doing more and more sets and we didn't do our usual flies and stuff. Like there's something to that. Like once you get settled into an exercise, just keep fucking going. Cause it's great. You already warmed up for your mind muscle connection. Your motor unit recruitment is amazing for that exercise. Now, James and I've talked about before, there's a point at which that bridges and then overflows, but that's usually in like the five set range. They can be on five sets. One exercise kind of gets a little crazy. But generally speaking, like, you know, much more than that is probably uh, bad, but much less than that is like, why are you, why are you trading off, uh, the, off the exercise? And it could just be like, you know, you would have better result if you just kept going because you're so tuned into that exercise. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you uh, do all three exercises or you're, or you're doing only one exercise on each day, that's fundamentally, that can be okay. As long as the number of sets doesn't greatly exceed five. So like, I think up to seven sets of one exercise is fine. But like, bro, if you're doing eight sets of leg press, like for the love of God, it's probably time you just get a better stimulus to fatigue ratio. If you switch exercises after like five ish sets. Right. So I think of the, uh, of the things you described sort of depending on the volume, let's say the volume is going up to 10 sets per session, I would say the one plus two, one plus three, and two plus three, the pairs thing is actually really good. Pepper that with some um, modulation of load. Like when you do the same exercise, it's at a different loading range. Like sometimes it's in a 15 to 20, sometimes it's in the 10 to 15, and then you have a really, really great formula. So I think that middle ground is probably best. Yeah, I agree. And I think the, the all three on each day, you're all, uh, this is going to a, a kind of a funny situation where even though you're training three times a week, you're actually going to start running into wear and tear related issues, especially if you don't modulate yes. some of the reps. Yes, that's another one. Mm -hmm. So totally. that's a downside with that. Mike already nailed the one exercise on each day, just probably not, unless you're doing a shitload of sets, it's probably not stimulative enough. And then you have an SFR issue when you're doing too many sets of one thing. So the best option I think is probably doing the, the pairs. That all being said, training three times a week, man, we're really splitting hairs at this point. So I don't think that you're going to see like profound differences between those three strategies. But if you were to try and make the most of doing three times per week, I would say that the latter one's the better yeah. one. And James, I think you brought up the most important point, which is a point I had in my brain and then forgot when I started talking, uh, that the wear and tear is really the problem with uh, training each exercise every single time you go in. Um, and it, it will result in roughly identical hypertrophy in any one meso, but two or three mesos in doing like, like that, your joints are going to start to feel it. Like the great thing about the hack squat, among other things, is it is not the leg press, right? If you just do everything every single time, it's going to be like your, your but tissues never get a chance to heal. And remember, connective tissues heal slower than muscles. So the really good thing about doing leg press one day, hack squat one day, high bar squat the other, is that the particular ways in which they irritate the joints are only replicated once a week. So you have one whole week to heal every single joint structure, but the muscles are hit every time and the muscles do heal just every few days. So that really, really can, uh, fits in super well. Yeah, definitely. Did we get all that? Yeah, we did. Okay, we cool. did. Yep. Uh, number three, person with three to five years of proper lifting with no underlying conditions and limitations, doing quad training two times a week using the following exercises, heavy squat, five to 10, moderate squat, 10 to 20, heavy leg press, five to 10, and moderate leg press, 10 to 20. If there's no intention of using pre-fatiguing, raw stimulus magnitude and SFR are as expected and comparable. No exercise is significantly better on these metrics. As a technique and three options to structure day, which one would you recommend? Uh, oh, I see. It's twice. Okay. Monday, heavy squat, heavy leg press. Thursday, moderate squat, moderate leg press. Monday, heavy squat, moderate leg press. Uh, Thursday, heavy leg press, moderate squat. Monday, heavy squat, moderate leg press. Thursday, moderate squat, heavy leg press. So uh, we can take Thursday out completely right now because moderate squat coming before heavy leg press makes no sense. You yeah. always want your heavy work to come before. Right, so we can just, just option C is gone, right? James, you with me so far? Definitely. Super. And then we have options A and B. Um, uh, option A is heavy squat, heavy leg press. And then Thursday is moderate squat, moderate leg press. And then uh, option B is heavy squat, moderate leg press. Uh, heavy leg press, moderate squat. Um, I think either one of those is fine. Yeah. Um, I would prefer you so there are definitely a, a couple of questions about this um 
I would generally prefer for more, so for intermediates, I honestly think it doesn't matter. For more advanced folks and the way intermediates should eventually train because they become advanced, probably option A is better. And here's why. Um, you only have so many really heavy lifting sessions in you per week. And if you do heavy squats and heavy leg presses on Monday, uh, you won't be fully recovered from a connective tissue and nervous system perspective, but you can get through moderate squats and moderate leg presses on Thursday, just grind the reps. However, for option B, when you have the heavy leg press on Thursday, you've sort of pre-damaged the tissues and made yourself really tired doing heavy squats and then moderate leg presses on Monday. And those moderate leg presses come with a usually very high volume. So taking that high volume, that high amount of soreness into Thursday's heavy leg press is not something I'm super comfortable with. The good thing about Monday, heavy squat and heavy leg press, is you probably won't get that sore from those things, but your connective tissues are going to be a little bit compromised, and so is your top end performance. But that's okay because you need neither one of those to be amazing for moderate squats or moderate leg press. And then after that workout, you get sore, but you recover extra, and then next Monday you come back. Um, in an, in, so, so my bias is a little bit towards option A, but I don't think it matters a ton. Option C, however, is just uh, out of the gate a uh, bad idea because the heavy leg press uh, comes after the moderate squat. James? Yeah, I like option A. I, I, I do like this, the setup of option B, and I think you can make option A a little bit more like that. When you're only lifting three times a week, it might be in your benefit to have a little bit more of a variety uh, in each one. Uh, you don't have to, certainly, and I think it might make a difference for some and not others. So you could say like heavy squat, meaning like kind of what we normally would say like five to ten. And you could say heavy leg press as like maybe like 10 to 15, maybe not mm -hmm. the 10, to, you know, yes. 10 to 20. And then you do the other, you kind of do the same thing over here. Moderate squats like 10 to 15. And then this moderate leg press is like 15 to 20. Just break it up yes. a little bit. Yes. Something like yes. that. Doesn't, yeah, you, you get the idea. But. I agree. I agree completely. Um, there's a bunch of improvements, James, that I could make to these as well. But for the purposes of the exercise, I think that's a pretty good answer. Number four, during deload, should one auto-regulate rest between sets with which with five plus RIR make it close to none on some exercises or intentionally pace down to make it closer to usual rest times. Um, I don't think it matters much, but I think your deload should not be overly stressful. So if you use pure auto-regulation of rest, you might make the workout much shorter, but the workout is still pretty tough and you probably don't want that. So what mm -hmm. I would do is intentionally rest a little longer so that you're never really that challenged. Uh, that's what I would say. I just spilled tea all over myself. God damn it. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also think part of the deload is is um, a psychological break from some of the rigidity of your normal training. So I honestly don't even fucking think about rest times on my deload because it's meant to be like a relief for me. So I'm not really thinking about it. I just go in, do whatever I feel like, you know, whatever I had set for myself. And then I just kind of do whatever. If I want to watch, uh, you know, five minutes of Instagram nonsense, that's fine. I don't care. It's just deload. I'm just doing whatever I want. So it's I'm not saying that's the best way, but I think there's uh, a good incentive to break from some of the rigidity of the normal structure. Number five, increasing frequency from one measure to the next by adding a new rep range. What would be the difference between adding a new rep range with an exercise that's already in the program versus a new exercise? If exercise is suitable for that, something like going from lateral raises with dumbbells in the 10 to 20 rep range, to lateral raises with dumbbells in both the 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 rep range versus adding cable lateral raises for the 20 to 30 rep range. Or similar example with bench press and push-ups. First exercise feels great with a big concern for overuse injury. And let's say that a two week active rest after that measure to further decrease the probability of overuse and staleness. Much appreciate your time. Well, so actually to answer your own question, I would say is if you don't anticipate overuse and stainless catching up with you towards the big, middle or, or end of that third meso, then you could absolutely repeat exercises, especially if they're feeling really baller. Like you're just really getting awesome, awesome everything with your lateral raises. Fuck it, do them twice a week. Um, but if you're at some point where like at the end of meso two, you're like, ooh, should I use a new exercise or should I use more lateral raises? And you're like, man, I don't know. Lateral raises are like, I hope they just go okay for this next last meso. Then definitely add a new one. So it's really anticipating. And actually the technical answer is this. Where do you think you'll get your best SFR? Like, will you get your best SFR by adding a new exercise or will you get your best SFR by keeping this current exercise? So if you're really well in the groove of this current exercise, you're seeing major PRs, your stimulus feels amazing, your fatigue feels super low, that might be your best option because you don't have to intro a new exercise. Because remember, when you intro a new exercise, sometimes it's SFR, takes a little bit of time to go up because you still got to groove it in. Um, but if it's really feeling like dog shit, then the answer is, uh, you know, that. I, I will tell you guys, um, there are really only two, cons not even two. The, the fundamental concern with variation is SFR. Like the, the question of do I add uh, a new, new exercise or do I keep the old one is like, which one's going to get the best SFR slash are you still progressing? 
really well. Like, and those two are very, very linked anyway. So people, you know, if you're, if you're an amazing SFR and you think like, look, I could switch to hack squad, but black presses are going amazingly. And I honestly don't even think hack squad would be better. Why the fuck would you do it? Right. But if you're like, oh man, like my leg press is feeling like total shit. Should I do hack squad? Well, will it be a better workout in that's the non scientific way of saying, is the SFR going to be better? And be like, yeah, hack squat would be totally better. Then fucking do it. That's it. Yeah, so I really agree with Dr. Mike here. Uh, it's, there's, for me, there's kind of two, two main things, and Mike already nailed the first one, which is just an issue of like SFR and staleness. So if the movement is going flat for you, that's just a, a pure independent reason why you would change exercises regardless of whether you're increasing frequency or rep ranges or anything like that. So that's by itself. If it's flat, you can swap it out. Uh, but more to the point on uh, increasing the frequency of muscle groups and uh, changing exercises. The only other condition is if you have an exercise that's just more appropriate for the rep ranges that you're trying to work in. So you might've been doing really, really well on your squats in like five to 10 and you're just mm -hmm. kicking ass on squats. But 10 to 20 on barbell squats or 20 to 30 on barbell squats, man, that's, it's a rough day at the office. So you might find that for 10 to 20, having a leg press in there is a really good option. Or for 20 to 30, like the knee extension, it might be a really good option. Something that's just slightly more appropriate for the rep range that you're going to be working in. So that would be an incentive reason to add a new exercise based on frequency and rep ranges. But you don't have to. And if things are going well and you're, if you have like a movement that's been – solid and it's going to stay pretty consistent across however many mesos you're working you just leave it in there's no reason to take it out unless you kind of hit those two conditions where it's like okay well now instead of doing five to ten I, my last meso i moved my heavy work up to like 10 to 15 and i'm having a hard time doing sets of 15 in the squat okay there's a reason um but you don't have to yeah that's a good point okie doke um areen salam all right real quick areen Quit double posting your questions. It's very confusing. I'm looking through this and I see you've listed the same question, listed the same questions again. Quit doing that. Just if, if you post it once, it'll get on there. Don't worry about it. We'll get you. Okay. We got your back, homie. Just once. It's good. Um, well, you know, it's an improvement for Irene who used to post these on Instagram as well. <laughs> yeah. So luckily we got him just to doubling up on RP plus. All right. Number one, I really, really like deadlifts for strength measure. I can do six to seven reps with 140 kilos and I'm 165, 58. However, my main goal is muscle size. How can I do deadlifts without affecting my hypertrophy goals as a whole? A whole lot. Well, that you, first of all, you want to do them in the right rep range. So you want to stick to sets of five to 10 and not go into the, uh, you know, under five reps. And you want to make sure that you're doing deadlifts, um, in such a way that they don't beat, beat you to shit for the rest of the week or beat you to shit for the rest of the workout. So I would limit the amount of volume you do on deadlifts to something that can allow you to, so for example, you do a couple sets of deadlifts in the five to 10 rep range, and then you go and do a hamstring curls and you go do leg presses and it's great. You can do both of those great still. But you wouldn't do like eight sets of deadlifts, vomit up blood, and then quit and be like, shit, it's really affecting my hypertrophy. So those are my two biggest recommendations. Um, well, make sure the rep range is right for hypertrophy. So it's a five to 10, no lower. And also just making sure that, you know, ideally you might want to do eight sets of deadlifts where hypertrophy is more ideal to uh, not to cause too much stomach fatigue for you to do them in, in you know, four or five sets, uh, then that's what I would do. Yeah. The, the kind of the root of the issue here is um, for the deadlift is when, when is it, when is the systemic fatigue restricting you from doing other things. That's when you know it's interfering with your hypertrophy training. So if you're doing so much deadlifting that you can't train back, you can't train legs, you can't do whatever else throughout the week or your forearms are shot, that's when you know you need to dial it back. And so this is the kind of classic intermediate conundrum. It's going to self-correct at some point where you're going to get so strong at the deadlift that doing those deadlift sessions, you're going to try and do the same volumes you have been doing. And all of a sudden you're like, man, I feel like I'm just I'm so wiped out. What is going on? Well, you got stronger and now it's just taking a bigger toll on your body. And that's a good time to kind of maybe re restructure some of your programming. But for now, you, I mean, not, no, no shame here, but just looking at your numbers, I think you can probably do plenty of deadlifting and get a lot of really good gains for the next couple of years. And it probably won't be a huge deal. Yeah. Great, great, great. Number two, can I just use the volume slash set landmarks for strength as well? Or does powerlifting have something special when it comes to sets? Uh, yeah, it does. And our book, Scientific Principles of Strength Training, actually talks about the rough set guidelines that are best for powerlifting. And even better than that, more updated is Chad Wesley Smith's work, specifically his YouTube videos on how much volume you should probably be doing as a powerlifter. And I would say Chad Wesley Smith, Juggernaut, uh, Juggernaut Training Systems, volume, strength training, type that into YouTube and you'll get a great, first of all, great channel with a great guy and him and Max Ada really have their stuff. No, uh, you know, they're just better at training people for strength than James and I in every conceivable capacity. 
And they have dialed the volume landmarks in for strength very, very well. So I look to those guys. Do not do the hypertrophy landmarks for strength. You will die. Yeah, so that's, that was my point. The volume landmarks apply to all sporting scenarios, all conditions. They always apply, but they're scaled differently for different activities. So in the case of strength training, they are significantly less than what you would use for hypertrophy. And that would also include like frequency and things like that as well. Likewise, if you're doing like sports training, they get scaled down because you have things like ex uh, technique, explosiveness, power, speed, all that stuff, right? So uh, they always apply. It's just contextual. Yeah, 100%. Will heavy deadlifts and squats grow my obliques to a point where they would make my waist thicker? Almost certainly not. Right? Mm -hmm. That's very easy. No. Um, number four, what's your recommendation on forearm training? Since we probably don't make a whole mess just forearms, <laughs> how to structure them in training. Yeah, hypertrophy hub. We have forearm training guide. Look it up. It's got all the details you want. Uh, you do make a whole meso just for forearms. You would just do them probably towards the end of a workout three to six times a week. Yeah, it's really super easy. Usually you just do one exercise per session. And, um, you know, forearms is one of those that like you can do eight sets of the same exercise and be totally fine because the systemic fatigue is minimal. Also resting between sets for forearms is like you rest five to 10 seconds and you're totally good. So it's actually very easy to train. You just have to be diligent. It's fucking boring, but it works. My forearms have gotten a lot bigger since I started training them about a year and a half ago. And it's, if you want bigger forearms, you train them like everything else. Solid. Forearms, the calves of the upper body. <laughs> 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 That's probably one of the stupidest things I've ever said. It was right. good. It was good. Yeah, it was answering yeah, pretty good. Uh, number five, how much Coke Zero is too much? Will certain citrix in it affect tooth health? Uh, what about the foric acid as relation to bone health? So there's almost nothing to the bone health uh, thing. That's almost total bullshit. Almost certainly total bullshit. The tooth health is Diet Coke's not that great for your teeth. Uh, it's better than regular Coke and better than anything with sugar in it, but it's not ideal for your teeth. So, uh, you know, that's actually a very dose response relationship kind of thing. But if you have like three to five Diet Cokes a day, very few dentists are going to tell you that you're like ending your life and your teeth are going to be total shit. If you have like 10 and maybe you're getting into some, you know, risk of you know, you're 50 years old, your teeth could be not so great. And then uh, as far as anything uh, else systemic, they're not really found a realistic limit. Uh, you can certainly drink about 20 Diet Cokes a day every day and be a hundred times under the level of anything they found to be deleterious to health. So yeah. how about it? Yeah, actually the dentists have a condition they call Mountain Dew mouth from people who drink a lot of like sugary soda, but that's usually yeah, because that's, it's, so it's mostly the sugar. Yeah, the, sugar. It is, the carbonation is not that great for your teeth from what I understand, but it's not nearly as bad as the sugar. So. I've noticed like when I, uh, I've had like, um, tooth sensitivity become an issue when I was drinking a lot of diet soda and I've, st I've dialed it back and started using the, like the more fancy toothpaste and it's helped a little bit. Nice. I only drink uh, carbonated sodas towards the evening. I have like one or two in the evening and I usually do either do plain water or like the uh, squirties. Like, squirties uh, are good. Uh, squirties are awesome because it makes their water not boring. Um, also, they're way cheaper than drinking a bunch of Diet Cokes. Yeah. Uh, number six, how can I get the most of the growth of ab training to my rectus uh, uh, abdomens? without any or much oblique growth and what would the benefit uh, be of doing vacuums? I have no idea. The vacuum question, I literally have just no idea. Uh, anything, uh, I mean, the vac you, doing the vacuum makes you better at doing the vacuum, which is nice. It uh, doesn't actually make your waist smaller, but good practice means you get to pull it off. And as far as how do you get your rectus femoris, this is actually a good answer to this question. You train them directly by doing flexion, loaded flexion exercises. Don't do things like the yoke walk and uh, stone carries and all this other shit uh, nice. and planks because that all uh, trains your obliques as well as your rectus femoris. I would just do variations of loaded crunches and sit-ups. That's the best way to directly train the muscle. And also, like, what's the harm with training your obliques here? I don't think, I think, like, you're under the, the very strange assumption that, like, if your obliques get trained, then they're going to make you look like a, like a barrel or something. But uh, I, don't, I, don't, I never saw anyone lose a bodybuilding show because their obliques were too big, unless I'm missing something. Yeah. Um, he changed number seven and number eight. So let me go down. Let's scroll down, James, to his last sure. seven. Because seven here is not a question, but it actually has a question on his repost. So if you scroll down here, um, number seven. Yeah. Okay. So this isn't really a question, but isn't the spike? Well, actually, it is a question because you're asking something. <laughs> Uh, isn't the spike of HGH during fasting due to the hormone metabolizing fasted sugars? Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Uh, so it's not actually anabolic. It can't be anabolic because there's no raw substrate for you to anabolize. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of people say like, oh, fasting is anabolic because it spikes growth hormone. No growth hormone is spiked because it's a, f a fuel mobilizer. It's spiking because it's like, hey, I'm fucking starving to death. 
let's get some fucking shit in the bloodstream so that my brain doesn't shut down. That's, that's really it. And um, then you, you have to look at it on the net balance too, where it's like, okay, well, you were fasting that whole time. What was the catabolic effect over the course of the day versus the net anabolic effect? Of the tiny spike of GH, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you explain why L-carnitine is overhyped? Yes, yeah, so the research is just not supporting do, massive effect sizes. Like, if I had, if you had to tell me like, uh, very confidently, what is, if, I, if I take L-carnitine, what's going to happen? You'd be like, well, uh, hypothetically, uh, and that would be it. That's it. Yeah, I tried, I, I, like everyone else, when I was doing the supplement experimentation back in the day, I tried L-carnitine. It's awful. It's kind of like li uh, leucine where it just doesn't yeah. fucking mix in anything and it doesn't yeah. do dick. So it's just worth, worthless. Um, I wanted to go back and address that one on previous number seven here. Uh, drugs are illegal. RP doesn't support their use. Just, yeah, keep in mind, like, it depends on where you live in terms of if they're illegal or not. In the United States, they are illegal. Yeah. RP, like, if you talk to any of us, like, and Mike and I have been very candid about drug use over the years. Um, we, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think I'm confident in saying that Mike and I don't have any moral objections. If people want to use steroids to, to enhance their bodies, great. There are ethical considerations, however, based on the law and based on if you compete in sports. And so I think we both yeah. agree that if, if, you, if you value the, that part of the law very rigidly, then you probably shouldn't do that. And if you value uh, you know, uh, sport competition and it's in its purest sense, then, and it says that's not allowed, then you don't do it. RP doesn't really have a position stance on it outside of that people should be obeying the laws in the cities and, and states and nations that they live in. And don't cheat at sport. And don't cheat, you know. Uh, so just keep that. And that's, that's, that, that came up last, last week just because there were some really, really specific individualized questions about drug use. And we just decided that it's not a good look for us to talk about something that is illegal. It's like, like uh, if it would be like if me and Mike talking about like, where, where can I get some cocaine and do cocaine? How much cocaine right. should I be doing? It's like, yeah, yeah it's not a good look, you know. For That's really sure. what that came down to. For sure. All right. Peyton Downs. Number one. Uh, I asked about not training on deloads last week. My question was misunderstood. That was my bad. So here it is. I've heard y'all say that not training at all on a week-long deload is fine and not much different compared to doing deload workouts. When I'm on a bulking diet and hit deload week, I do not train at all that week. Aha. Okay. It helps me a lot mentally. So, I, so can I do the same thing on a cutting diet when I deload? Obviously, weight maintenance calories that week for the cutting deal. Yeah, I think that's fine. I don't think it's going to be optimal, but I think it's going to be quite good. So he's, he's saying he just doesn't... She doesn't train at all on a deal. I think it's worse on a cut than it is on a mass, uh, but I don't think it's a huge deal. I mean, it's just like me being nitpicky yeah. about it. Um, as long as you're really going to maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Do not, yeah. If you're hypocaloric and you don't train, real, real bad idea. Yeah. At what age can humans start weight training? And will it really stunt growth? So there's actually a, the there's no reason to believe that weight training of any kind stunts growth. Uh, that turns out to be almost entirely myth based on the literature we have now. And more literature might come out later that says actually it does stunt growth, but the current evidence is just is somewhere, somewhere between highly convincing and theoretically impossible. For example, the forces, people say it's too much force for a kid's growth plates. If a kid jumps up and down, it's like six, three to six times body weight force. And like you can't squat that much when you're a kid. So I don't know what's going on there. It's very unlikely. As far as what age, it actually has much more to do with psychology than it has to do with physiology. You can get kids uh, moving around heavy objects if they think they're fun from age two, three, as long as they don't drop them on themselves. Um, but as far as uh, weight training in the sense of a rigid, highly boring to children activity, I would say a great time to start kids on it is when they express interest in it and you start them with a very, very fun kind of like mini kids strongman. And then if they, uh, once they grow up and they're like 12 or 13, they might be like, man, I, I want to start training with barbells and machines. You're like, okay, that's what you want. And then you give them a little kitty routine. And then slowly but surely, by the time they're 16, 17, they're training like more or less adults. Um, I think pushing weight training out of children in any other form, just going to make them fucking hate it and hate you and the whole thing sucks. And weight training is boring as fuck. It's like, when, you know, when's a good idea for children to start accounting? Like maybe never, you know, uh, but, you know, certainly, you know, you don't start with uh, kids who hate the idea of sitting down and concentrating for 30 seconds. Uh, bad idea for both accounting and weight training, James. Yeah, I think I haven't looked at this in a little while, but the, the, since the last time I've looked at it, it's really more about managing their training loads than anything else because you get um, gymnastics people who don't lift any weights as children and they're incredibly tiny people when they grow up. It's probably more of an issue of like how much pounding and how much exposures are they getting rather than the actual lifting of the weight and the resistance on their body. So as Mike said, like impact forces from doing like a backflip off a balance beam is going to be way more high, way higher than anything you can put on your back and squat up and down. So my understanding, and again, I might be a little out of date here, but it was it's more about like just managing their training loads and not giving them an adult size training regimen uh, as children in terms of any of those growth related issues. 
So, um, okay. Have you all ever signed autographs for a fan? Because I'm doing that shit when I see you, Dr. Mike, be ready. LOL. <laughs> yeah, I have signed a few <laughs> autographs. Uh, good God. Yeah, it's a trippy experience. Um, I don't take myself very seriously, so I highly suggest you you don't either. Uh, number four, Mike, do you have any idea of what vitamin show you might do? No, I don't. I want to take leave so I can come watch. Please do not waste your leave watching me fuck up another bodybuilding show. Um, you can always look at pictures. Bodybuilding shows suck. Pictures are better anyway. Um, the only person that has to come with me to bodybuilding shows, cause most, most, most because he wants is Jared Feather. She's really my coach. Um, Folks, but, if you've uh, never been to a bodybuilding show, it's awful. Like it's fun to see your friends and people you know compete. Other than that, it sucks. It's like it's if like you've ever seconds if you've ever been to a wrestling meet, it sucks. It's hours of watching, watching people you don't know do stuff, and you're like, "Why am I here? This blows." It's don't go. Don't go. Peace from shitty South Korea. Shitty motherfucker, are you out of your mind? South Korea is one of the greatest nations on earth. You, look, if South Korea is shitty, where the fuck is not shitty? That's what I want to know. Philly. Yeah, like Philadelphia is so much better than Seoul. I'm like, you're kidding, right? Like, Get the fuck first. out of here. All right, the one who hacks, Daniel Hacker. If an individual has a high MRV for muscle, let's say 25 to 30 sets as an example, are they better suited to choose less exercise variants and perform said variants multiple times a week and change the rep range? Or would it be a better practice to increase the variation over the course of the week? Would it all come down out on the wash at the end of the mass cycle? Because if one chooses the former, they will likely have to rotate their exercise selection more often uh, because the movements will get stale faster. And if one chooses the latter, they are likely to be able to stick to those exercises for more mass cycles in a row since the overall volume for each exercise is less. To give some numbers, I'm characterizing less exercise variance as two to three exercises versus four to five. There's increased variation. Uh, is your answer also experience dependent, intermediate, advanced, won't count beginners here? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of nailed it. Uh, James, that's why James and I have like a, we literally, our exercise recommendation per week is I believe two to five, like in the upcoming hypertrophy book. So e either one of those ranges is just a trade off of exactly what you said. Like if you use a lot more of the variance, then you can keep that up for longer. If you use, very few variants. You can't keep it up for longer, but you get to rotate them. Uh, so it's really, it really comes down to, uh, again, to SFR. Like start with some exercises and the ones that lose their SFR competitively relative to other ideas, other exercises, you can put them in. Uh, and we, what we don't want you to do is use that four to five if you only have four to five top tier SFR movements. Then there's nothing to replace them with. So if you have like, eight to 10, two to three versus four to five, eight to 10 exercises you could potentially use, two to three or four to five is the same fucking thing. Uh, but uh, if you have four or five exercises total that are good, then gee whiz, like, so for example, let's use like legs, you know, like you have, let's say you're a gym where you have like high bar squat, leg press, hack squat, and lunge, maybe leg extension. That's your five exercises right there. If you use all five in one meso, what the fuck are you going to do when some of those start to turn stale? I yes. mean, for the love of God, if it's literally no, there's no answer to that. And what if they all go stale close to the same time? What are you doing to take a break? Like that, then two to three exercises is better. Then you would do like heavy squats, light squats, heavy leg press, light leg press. And then later you have hack squats and lunges and leg extensions to weave in at various points. And I agree. And I find that there's a there's the sweet spot there because like – um. You could also say like, okay, well, don't use that many variations. And then you have kind of like wear and tear related issues like we talked about before where it's like, okay, I'm always doing lateral raises all the time. And at some point, like there's just a, a threshold where I just can't do any more lateral raises. Um, I find that using the different rep ranges is almost just as good as sometimes getting a different uh, exercise. So if you have a movement that's it's good for you, a good SFR movement in the five to 10 rep range, it's probably still going to be a good movement for you in the 10 to 20 rep range, if not even better in some cases, right? So in those cases, you might actually find that if you have limited options or if you're just trying to conserve some of the variants because you want to use some of your better ones for the next block, just using a different rep range on the same movement can kind of extend the life of that movement a little bit more. The downside is that you're using the same movement, which can increase the wear and tear on the structures involved. So, but again, it's lighter. So you kind of mitigate some of that risk as well. So for me, that's a really good sweet spot where if you're trying to conserve some movements, just use the same movements in different rep ranges throughout the week and you get a very similar benefit. All right. Next question from Daniel Hacker is when did you both learn to really think for yourselves in regards to fitness and nutrition, allowing you to challenge what would have been uh, knowledgeable people in the field and ultimately allow yourselves to think freely enough to actually develop your own concepts. I can answer for myself first. Um, I've always been like that uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, my only qualification for believing people is does what they say make sense. And so when they say stuff that makes sense, I say, wow, this guy really knows his stuff. I'm going to do that. 
if, if and when people said stuff that I don't think made sense and every level of uh, forever about fitness, if someone said something that didn't make sense, I would ask them to clarify. I'd be like, well, as you say this, but what do you make of this? And sometimes they would answer very well. And I'd be like, well, actually you're correct. Or sometimes they would answer very poorly or tell me to go fuck myself. And then I'd be like, you know what? That doesn't make any sense. And then I would arrive at what I thought my best guess for what was going on, including no guess at all. And just picking something at random because I better pick something at random than something that's, I think is demonstrably wrong. So that is how I had to be just like, I don't know, genetically or some shit comes to me as I never believed anyone on just the word that they were saying. I, I have almost no capacity for faith whatsoever. As you can imagine, I abandoned the idea of religion quite, quite early. So James. Yeah. Well, and, and just part of being an academic, you're taught very early on to be skeptical and to use critical thinking. Right. And so what you find a lot in, in exercise science and academia in general is just somebody will say something and it's true or, or largely true in, in one situation, but not in others. And that's where critical thinking comes into play, especially in exercise science um, where we say like, yeah, that seems to make sense here, but it doesn't explain the same situ the same thing in a different situation. And that's where like being able to weigh the pros and cons of ideas and say like, okay, I can see like uh, Dr. Stone was really good about some, the basics where he'd be like overload. It matters. There's no way around overload. And you're like, okay, that makes perfect sense. There's, there's no situation in which you're talking about exercise or sport and the overload principle does not apply. Right. But he, then he'd say something like tens and you're like, okay, why tens? Why does tens matter? And he'd be like, because of hypertrophy and work capacity. And you're like, which one? And he's like, Shut up. and then you have to think like, okay, so what is more important, right? Is it, is it the actual muscle gaining size? Is it actually gaining a tolerance to training or is it somewhere in the middle? Like where, how do those apply to the things that we're trying to do? Just an example. Like, and so you just learn to not just take things at face value because you're supposed to have a skeptical mind. Um, but also thinking about like, how could it be true and how could it not be true? What are the conditions in which it can be applied almost universally or not at all? So that's part of it. It's not, Mike and I are not unique in this way. We just, uh, we're just curmudgeon when it comes to the things that we're really interested in. And when somebody says like, I think you should do glute blasters for good glute development so you can be a good sprinter. We will take every point along that line and go, hmm. I don't know. Let's think about this a little bit more. Let's talk about each of these points. You know, that's just, just the type of people that we are. So TLDR, you can do that whenever you want. <laughs> and either you will be shown that the other person is correct or that they're not. And like, you might not have the knowledge base. So like, I'm not going to, like, I might be skeptical if somebody says something uh, regarding economics. I don't know fucking dick about economics. And then I'm entitled to my opinion. But for me, I'm not going to speak out and say like, well, here's James theory of economics that I right. just, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, if, that's I, how you I, become a clown. Right. Just know your role. Like, you know, you stay in your lane. Like if you, if you have a lot of knowledge on something and you can piecemeal things together really well, then, then great. Speak up on it and put your ideas out there. And if not, go back to the drawing board and figure it out. Yeah. All right. From the people's nation of Brazil, Rafael Soge. <laughs> oh, I, I wonder how he says that name, but that's my guess. Rafael Soge. Yeah, I think so. All right. He says, I would love to read my read all this in Brazilian accent, but I'm not going to. Uh, hello, Dr. Mike. Dr. Nato Laranja. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hello, it's me again, the poster boy <laughs> from Johnny Walker Black, race humor. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, There's actually a Brazilian MMA fighter named Johnny Walker, by the way. That's true. It's, what a, it's so, so weird. Like, that's the most American name maybe ever. It's, it's really intense. Um, <laughs> And then he says, still, still walking as if my life depended on, on it. <laughs> fat still melting. All right. Excellent. I already think, I already thank Mike on Instagram and he respond picture that miracles do happen. And I want to thank James personally. Well, kind of LOL. Get the fuck out of here. All right. Let's go to the questions. Number one, as I mentioned previously, doing a lot of cardio still, I wanted to know how is the best strategy to lower the cardio to nothing if you want or need to without gaining too much fat. I eat I less. <laughs> right. I will be after diet doing what you guys suggested, but I now want to do five days of the week, half my cardio, two hours. What is the option? The days that I do not walk like this two hours, should I decrease calories or the amount that I eat kind of lost there? Uh, what I'm saying is how can I eat more, move less and keep the body fat as lean as I got? You can't, that's fucking physically impossible. But what you can do is eat a lot of healthy food that fills you up a lot, lots of fiber, lots of protein, lots of more raw foods, foods that have high volumes and foods that aren't super, super tasty. So what you end up is you feel like you're eating a fuck ton and physically volume of food you can eat a lot, but you just don't gain a ton of weight. So don't eat a bunch of junk food and you can be halfway there. And the less cardio you do, then the less aggressive you can get with your diet. But I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how easy it is to stay relatively lean 
by doing just a modicum of cardio and not just going insane with eating. The way people rebound on diets and get super fat is they stop doing all their cardio and they eat junk, 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 junk. If you eat like just junk a little bit here and there, you eat mostly clean, you keep your calories in check, you do a little bit less cardio and then a little bit less, I think you'd be totally fine. And if, if, if you're not totally fine, either eat a little less or increase the cardio or just get fat. Those are three options. Yeah. And sometimes like if you're just burnt out on doing that much cardio, it might be just a good time to pick a new hobby. Like Mike does jujitsu. I'm not currently, but I was doing kickboxing for a long time. That's a good way of just staying really active and you get the benefit of uh, just a lot of neat and you get to eat a lot. So that's a good option if you are kind of, if you've been low on your hobbies, start ramping those up if you don't want to do cardio, but there's ultimately no way around it. Those energy expenditure and energy intake is going to be the, the main determinant there. So sorry, buddy. Yeah. Pick one. Which do you like to starve or do you want to exercise more? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, I have a good understanding of bodybuilding after stalking you guys for a couple of years, <laughs> but there is something I can't figure out. I think I'm an outlier in volume. Weight skeptical James filtering mm. being applied. <laughs> I can do a lot of work in most muscles. Um, I very rarely get sore. I do get sore in my hams, quads rarely, but the upper body, if I do like 12 sets per session max, I can do a lot of weekly volume, like 40 sets of bench press in the last week, no overreaching. Do large volume jumps and recover just fine. I'm an experienced lifter, so I think I know my RR close enough. I do not get sore, but I grow like crazy. It's just a day I never had a muscle that did not grow well. I had a problem with my arms in relation with the rest of my body because I was training like we do here, like... Denis Savano style. I wonder what the fuck that is. But after I saw Mike's video frequency and got in tune with the Russian sapiens about volume and frequency, my arms got much bigger. And I was uh, the last two years almost in a constant caloric deficit, had to lose 40 kilograms in the last two years and still growing two to three centimeters without the fat. Wow. I don't understand nice. what happens. I can get great gains. I feel the muscle tired. I experience some lag of performance, but almost never get sore. Should I try to bump up more volume? No, because you don't want to do lag of performance, right? It's because of the fiber type conversion from the diet. Uh, how am I growing then? Clearly growing in a caloric deficit. So here's the deal, man. Not everyone gets super fucking sore. A lot of soreness has to do with your immune response. A lot of soreness has to do with structural stuff, muscle insertions, how you execute the exercises. Some of it's just not under your control. We really just not worried about getting sore. What we're worried about is that you're doing enough volume and progressing in volume to make sure that you're finding your MRV. And MRV has nothing to do with soreness. MRV is only defined and stated and detected and acted upon based on performance. So as long as you're slowly and gently increasing volume, but you're still not dec declining in performance, it's stable or increasing, you get to go. So you should be able to calculate all of your MRVs on performance anyway. And look, if you're hitting your MRVs on performance, you can't possibly do more to chase soreness because it's not possible to do more in benefit. So if you never get sore all the way up to your MRV, motherfucker, you're just never going to get sore. It's not a fucking problem. Um, but like if, you know, and as long as you're not doing any crazy, like taking a ton of Advil or some shit like that, like, uh, you know, a ton of ibuprofen or you're getting good sleep and stuff like that. If you don't get sore, some people just don't get really sore. And if you're growing, not getting sore, but you're pushing the volume. Actually, I'll tell you this. If you're growing really well, fuck all the shit. Don't do anything differently. Uh, That's what I'm like, what are you complaining yeah, about? You don't complain. In both worlds, you're yeah, recomping yeah. like a motherfucker. You're, whatever you're doing, it's right. That's it. That's it. This 100%. guy's probably on that Bomba train. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, He's stop taking stuff. so much Bomba. Or those acai bowls. Those are fucking amazing. That's same thing. Also, <laughs> also Bomba. Number three, I can do so much volume that I can train my back and legs in the same session because I'm prioritizing arms. I'm thinking after this last diet cycle, finally starting adding two-a-day training like you guys recommend in the Revive Stronger podcast. Okay, very good. There are people that don't get sore at all. Yes. Yeah. It's like I'm a compound, <laughs> big side delt fiber. <laughs> <laughs> what got me nervous that I might, might be stupid is the volume landmarks. I can double the recommendations almost easily without, without hams. Five sets of that, I'm fucked for a week. If I didn't grow, I could say I'm doing something very wrong, but I do grow a lot in a caloric deficit, sometimes severe one. Should I push more volume? Uh, I guess this is actually really an interesting question. I feel the effects of fatigue. The burden I do these performances is absurd. As I absurdly progress in volume, but I do not get sore. Solve the puzzle, please. There's no yeah. puzzle. You won. You already figured it out. You're winning. Already figured it out. As long as your performance is increasing or stable during the mesocycle, it's not falling. You're doing an appropriate amount of volume, so you're totally fine. Uh, and you can do a little bit more volume. And if it still doesn't decrease your performance, great. You'll probably just grow more. So. And it's it. okay to be a bit of an outlier. Like we, those oh. recommendations that we post are meant for the general populace and there's going to be people on both tails of the spectrum there and you're just on the high volume side. That's fine. Dude, I, I know people who get really sore. They don't even get great results. Like that sucks way that worse. Sucks. Like, yeah. That's way worse. Um, all right. James said something very interesting about the proliferation of Brazilian clients. Your ideas are starting to spread here slowly, but Brazil is 
Very, very fit country. We lack a knowledge. We compensate an effort, but a good part of the population do not have the ability or intention to go after information. <laughs> That's most of America. Most of us do not speak English at all. Actually, most of Americans don't want information, but they do speak English. That's a fucking irony. That <laughs> I perceive in Brazilian social media that the more intellect inclined you are using your methodology, a base form, and trying to make profit for your effort. I'm being serious. I do not want to overstep like, my boundaries. Like he's saying, like if you're uh, if you're coming off as an intellectual, then you're, you're, you're you sound like a hustler. Is that yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, in any way, shape, or form, we have great market in a fitness area dominated by morons and fad people. <laughs> you guys help me think. Uh, Help me, and I think you could dominate the market here. You guys help me, and I think you could dominate the market well, I feel, here. I feel I a said. pyramid scheme coming on. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> we train like cavemen. Your book will be marvelous for people here. If you think people want to be fit in America, you have to come to Brazil. The problem is we lack the tools to do it. In a title of exemplification, intermittent fasting just got here, and people are going crazy. Fuck. That's, that's <laughs> so funny. As a friend, I don't want to lack uh, the – real meaning of the word, but putting in better terms as a grateful non-paying customer that use your knowledge. Uh, if you feel interested, I would enjoy helping you guys as much as I could. I'm a lawyer. I do not know about publishing rights, etc. but that can easily be solved. I'm a taxation lawyer, so I can be of some help. No charge at all. This is not my intent just to help. I'd be furious with your book was plagiarized by some clown that doesn't understand a thing. I'm going to have a translator. It will be, uh, it will be Lyle McDonald's book, A Guide to Flexible Dieting, was plagiarized like four years ago by a fitness influencer. I had already read it and got me furious because it basically translated without reference to the credit author. Oh, wow. Uh, that even the sucks. name wasn't changed. Uh, that's the level of ignorance we are dealing with here. On a happier note, I saw an RP video and Mike said, he can rap. Man, get out of here. It's not my native speaking language, but I will drop you some bars. Ooh, oh, damn. Ooh. He's about here to rap for us. You got okay, to you you read it as if you were rapping, Mike. Cool. Let me, before I do that, uh, just to respond here, uh, have I to your question? Um, thank you so much for the offer. We'll absolutely consider it. Um, we have some folks that uh, may be in the market to translate our work for Brazil. James, you know who that is. Um, so we'll give it some thought. It's always a, always a thing. Yeah. All right. So I'm your rap nemesis. Now sync to my level. Okay. That's not part of the rap. <clears throat> uh, why so serious? You better be religious. I will get you cook. I thought it said cock for a second. <laughs> you said you beat Jared Feather. Is he mute or rather come to me? Let's go to war in this rap battle. I will show you what the B in Brazilian stands <laughs> for. Doesn't it stand for Brazil? Brazil. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> <laughs> you won't go far. I will submit you in this rap with a flying arm bar. You, you said you <laughs> in the break dance, a joke like squat with a wide stance. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Boy, you are at your MRV. Don't even try to go against me. I will slap you with your croc slippers. I am the third rural ripper. <laughs> Show me at your crib. Leave like an e Ethiopian stripper. Oh boy, this is <laughs> going downhill quickly. Oh, fuck. I well, surely I win this hell. It was easier than learning economics from Thomas so well. Oh man. My conclusion, my inference. Let's see what you can <laughs> spot with all your podcast references. Mike Trot, beat that LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, dude, we got served. I mean, he better he better be break dancing after that one. He got served. Rafael, obrigado. Seriously, that was fucking baller shit. You just got elevated to like RP plus god status. Oh man, RP we plus OG. That was amazing. Why are you doing this to us? No, Rafael. By the way, James and I have like uh, really we work on our Brazilian guy impression. So let us know, and then if you watch if you watch this webinar, let us know how we're doing. Like as far as Brazilian guy, like what? What you mood? Why you can no can have? Why you say this thing? Rafael, there's a um a comedian here in the United States. His name, uh, <laughs> his his stage name is Renato Laranja. He basically just does, his whole shtick is he spoofs Br uh, Brazilian people, and he's so good that he'll just like fighters and jujitsu guys. Yeah, he'll he's so good that people don't realize that he's not Brazilian, but he's just putting on an act. So uh, look him up. He's really funny. He's meant he's more for like the jujitsu crowd, but yeah. his Brazilian guy impression is so good. You'll you'll appreciate it. Amazing. All right, Stephen Caserta. Caserta. Hi, I'm 5'4", 140 pounds, 29 years old, and I've been training since I was about 18, 19 years old. Primarily in strength and some CrossFit. More recently, I've started hypertrophy bodybuilding style training. I've been watching and reading everything Dr. Mike puts out. I recently, with the help of the hypertrophy training guide articles at the at-home workout program, as well as the free at-home workout program, 
have designed a program that I will start next week. During quarantine, I've acquired some equipment. <laughs> I like acquired equipment, fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, during this riding, I have come to acquire several pieces of equipment. <laughs> and some spray, uh, some, uh, spray cans. That's right. I have a barbell and 196 pounds of weights. For my strength, this covers most of what I need in order to fall into the proper rep ranges for each muscle group. My biggest struggle will be quad growth as that weight isn't enough for me to bring close to failure with the proper rep ranges. Last time I maxed out at a back squat of 355. Okay. My question is, what can I do, if anything, to train my quads with barbell reaching failure in the 5 to 10 rep range? Given that the weight is currently limited, I was thinking adding pauses or even switching to some sort of single leg movement. The single leg movement's an idea. There's, so there's two problems. Problem number one, when you're pausing, uh, the 5 to 10 rep range paused is metabolically equivalent to the 10 to 20 rep range not paused because the total time under tension and the amount of tension is actually the same. So that doesn't solve the problem. of uh, 5 to 10 rep range isn't the magic. It's the force that's the magic. Now, the force would hypothetically be solved by single leg movements, but unfortunately, they're so, uh, so unstable that they're probably not maximum force generating, even if you get them into the 5 to 10 rep range. So those I don't think are very good solutions. And then he, uh, after, so he says another question, but I think my best answer is to, for, for the duration of the quarantine, and I can... I can bet with current trends, it won't last very long in almost any place. Um, I think that you're better off just training plenty in the 10 to 30 rep range. And then, you know, you don't need ever actually to train a five to 10 rep range for excellent gains. You probably need some of your training for optimal gains, but you can go years without ever touching anything in the five to 10 and get amazing gains. So I would just say do lots of pause squats, front squats, high bar squats, um, heel elevated squats uh, with that weight and some walking lunges and stuff, and you will have fucking jacked quads by the time the quarantine is over. So I wouldn't even bother going to five ten rep range, James. Yeah, I was actually going to say the same thing. I think you'll do with that amount of weight. You could add pauses. You could do close stance. You could do front squat, and you can probably actually still get a pretty pretty good. Uh, well, you get a great stimulus. But I was saying, I was thinking, if you do some exercise variations like that, you probably will be in like the ten to fifteen rep range, which is still. Mm-hmm pretty, pretty freaking good. So I really wouldn't even sweat it. I think you'll do just fine. If you're not hitting the, the five to 10 on high bar squats, so uh, change the exercise variation a little bit. And you'll probably get pretty close to it. Yeah. Another question. If I'm performing a movement and trying to stay within, let's say eight to 12 rep range on the first set, I hit nine and then eight, should I decrease my weight to stay in the rep range on the next uh, set or keep the weight constant and allow the reps to fall out of the rep range? I appreciate all your help all the hard work you guys put in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you as well. Um, so there are some technical reasons why you might want to stay in that range for all of the reps, but that's usually not the case. He, um, letting the reps fall is just fine until and unless they get to uh, sets of five or less, then you boost them. So I think it's fine to start in any rep range and let your reps drop by any amount un- unless they get below five. James? Yeah. And another thing you might think about is like uh, your pumps in mind muscle. Like if you're dropping, your reps are dropping and you're just kind of feeling blah, if dropping, uh, doing a down set would get you back into a good mind muscle, good pump situation, that's a good incentive to do that. Um, you don't have to do that. I usually, uh, with like beginner clients, I'll say more rigidly, like I want you in this range just so they kind of get used to rep ranges and RIRs. And as they become more intermediates, I'll kind of expand that out. So if I said, uh, you know, if I said eight to 12 and they get the first set is 15, next set's 13, next set's 10, that's fine. You know what I mean? And if they're an advanced client, as long as their first set is basically in that goal rep range, whatever else happens from there is fine for the most part, as long as it doesn't go below five. All right. Zhao Chen Lu says, hi, Dr. Michael James. Thank you for answering my questions last week. It was very helpful. I have a question regarding compound versus isolation exercises. I feel a much better pump from flies than bench press. And at a failure, I feel my pecs have been way more taxed from flies than a bench press. Would it be correct in saying that if the sole purpose is pec hypertrophy flies is a much better exercise, having elbows bent enough so that the biceps are not a limiting factor, and the only advantage of the bench press has over flies the reduced risk of injuries? I mean, maybe that might not even actually be the case. From Dr. Mike's video, I know that sets of six to eight is the major factor in stimulating faster twitch uh, fiber and hypertrophy in general, doing uh, flies, curls, hamstrings, flies, curls, hamstring curls, and other isolation exercises where the targeting muscle fails before the supporting muscles for that exercise in the six to eight rep range seems more injury prone for muscle connective tissue tear. And that's the only reason we're not focusing on them. I mean, yes, I can get big pecs if I was benching 140 kilograms for 20 reps, but wouldn't it be more time efficient to focus on flies instead? Imagine how big my pecs would be if I was flying 70 kilogram dumbbells for 20 reps. Thank you. Zhao Chen Liu, big pecs lover. 
Uh, so I think that um, your Sounds experience good. is actually quite uh, unusual. Most people get better pumps and better feeling of tension perception in their pecs with lower weight during compounds. But because at least for flies, you happen to feel that flies are a really, really great exercise for you, because you feel your pecs are really super taxed and because it feels like pecs failure is occurring, that I would, for you as a recommendation, that James and I are very uh, sort of not big fans. So hold on a sec. Hi, honey. Hi. I'm at a webinar. Cool. Just let you know. Um, so, uh, you know, James and I rarely like to say, okay, never do this again and only do the thing that works. Uh, but it, you know, if James and I were programming for you, we would program much more flying and much less benching. Does that mean no benching? No, probably not. Because if you don't bench for a while, you do very little benching. Benching as, as far as a marginal improvement to your training is actually quite good. Like, uh, because it's, it's, you sprinkle it in, it's just doing too much of it as something you don't want to do. So I would say, yeah, do plenty of flies, but don't write off the bench completely. And if you are, you know, for other uh, exercises uh, like hamstrings and, and, and biceps, if you also feel that uh, isolations are doing good, that's totally fine. As far as doing them heavy, usually that's injury is not a factor until and unless you feel like, holy fuck, if I do like this heavy, like, my tendons do not feel right. My positioning doesn't feel right. It feels like I'm going to get hurt. If that's not the case, you're totally fine. Um, just don't do anything stupid. Really control the eccentric and the descent, and that will make sure that injury risk is, is much lower. The thing is, injury risk is not the number one factor that precludes us from programming isolations in the low rep numbers. It's usually that most people just don't feel a fucking thing if they do. Yeah, and also um, the compound movements just tend, and the, the more recent terminology just tends to have a better STR, stimulus to time ratio, where in terms of like if you're going to work your, your delts and your triceps and your pecs all on the same day, like the bench is just a more efficient way of kind of hitting all of those, checking all those boxes. Whereas like if you just do flies, then you're going to have to have a distinctly different warm up period and exercises for your triceps, same thing for your shoulders, et cetera. So, uh, it's not that one is good or bad. Like in terms of SFR and bodybuilding purposes, you can kind of pick and choose if the flies are really good for you. You can prioritize them, absolutely. But it doesn't mean that you should take bench out necessarily. Because also think about this. How many variations on bench press can you do? A shitload. How many variations on flies can you do? A bunch, but not that many, right? You have your flat, your incline, and then kind of the in-between ones, and then cable. After that, you're going to run out of options. So you might exacerbate some of your S, your highest SFR movements relatively quickly. Whereas with the bench, you can do dumbbell bench at a number of different angles. You can do barbell, medium grip, close grip, wide grip, incline, medium, close grip, up, wide grip, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of, uh, a lot of options with the barbell, whereas the flies are going to be a little bit more limited. Or, I'm sorry, with the, with the, with the compound pressing. Yeah. Okay. Danny Machiedo says, Hey there docs. New member here. Thanks for the free month, by the way. I'm doing this another shot because I commented on the last seminar thinking that was where you guys get your questions from, but it turns out it was here all along. Yeah. For, the, for the YouTube people, it is. For RP Plus members, you found it. Anyway, my first question is regarding assessing performance while doing bodyweight home workouts. Let's say I'm bulking and my performance on pull-ups in week four of my last mezzo is the same as my performance in week four of the current mezzo. Considering the fact that I'm heavier, is it reasonable to consider this progress of performance? Oh, yeah, of course it's progress. Yeah. If you're if more force done for the same number of reps, that's great. That's the easiest question we'll answer all day. <laughs> My second question is regarding metabolite training. I'm wondering if there's uh, any problem with doing metabolite phase while in a deficit. No, there's not. My home gym situation will get a little bit worse in the coming weeks, and I figured <laughs> like losing a piece of equipment. Um, and I figured my bench press is dying. Um, mm -hmm. And I figured I could use metabolite training and higher reps to achieve a better stimulus with limited equipment, but also planning on starting a cut at the same time. Is that anything you would recommend? Is it worse or equal? Just wondering what your thoughts on it. Uh, well, so, you know, like we've said to a couple of other related question askers, starting a cut on metabolites is something we usually don't recommend. So if you anticipate your gym situation won't get much better um, for months and months, then cutting on a metabolite, not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, but if you anticipate doing like one meso and then gyms opening up, then you're totally fine. James? Yeah, I agree. It's just not something you want to spend months and months and months doing, but as kind of a quick fix until things are back on track, I think it's fine. All right. Ooh. Um, okay. So, that. hey, Mike, real quick. We're at uh, page 12 of 27, and we've been going for about an hour. How you, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, let's uh, let's do this as a two-parter. Let's uh, get through Erno Toivinen and Ismar 
Sakirovich. I, 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 I had to copy and paste that one. I was like, ah. Oh. Is, Ismar Sakirovich. Uh, and we'll get through those two guys, and then we'll save Hayden Dunn and the rest for maybe we'll record tomorrow or something. Cool? Yeah, sounds great. All right, Erno Teubenen. Hi, Mr. Doctors from Finland again. You know, Erno, we would appreciate if you ask questions from somewhere else. We're getting tired of you being in Finland. Fucking boring things. us. <laughs> All right. Number one, thanks for answering my sleep uh, fatigue WTF problems. Just to add... Um, so, okay, just real quick, and this is funny. And, and honey, I swear to God, I'm not, like, I'm not saying it. This is your expense. My wife is exclusively manipulating objects that have the loudest crinkle factor ever. <laughs> like, like, I didn't even know we had, like, there's the, the, the plastic baggies that are just like, you know, it's like when you go into a, I love you, baby, no hard feelings. Uh, you know, like when you go into, um, James, you ever try to eat in like a large lecture hall with a professor and you're trying to open up a bag of pretzels and you're like, is yes. this a 20 decibel bag of pretzels? Like, did they somehow get an airliner noise into the pretzel bag and seal it? <laughs> Remember when Doc Stone did that when somebody was presenting in one of our weekly meetings and I think Howard finally just snatched it out of his hand and opened it all the way. He was like fussing with it for like 10 minutes and Howard was like, just give me the fucking bag. Because uh, it's like you're trying to open it quietly so you want to do less forceful, but that just means it takes longer. Just takes forever. <laughs> and then and the worst part is like people, they, there's a sigh of relief when you open the bag, but then you start eating the pretzels and it's like... Yeah. <laughs> hum, 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 like, hum. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's funny. All right. So, um, Irma Toyvinen says, uh, open them later. say that again, honey. I'll open them later. Baby, you can do it. It's not, it's not a big deal at all. I just meet myself when I'm not talking. Um, thanks for answering my sleep fatigue with the WTF problems. Just to add on James's comment about the prescribed sleep medicine, I've been prescribed doxapin in a very small dose. Honey, what's doxapin? It's a sleep med. Yeah. So he says, doxapin is a medication used to treat major major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, chronic hives, and trouble sleeping. That's like, God damn, that's like a shotgun pill. It's like, hey, what's wrong with you? Like, actually, I don't care. Here's doxapin to treat that shit. I like, there's the little references in there too. So I'm, I'm guessing that was a copy paste job from Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> well, references below in his, yeah. Um, and trouble sleeping for hives. It is less preferred alternative to antihistamines. It is a mild to moderate benefit for sleeping problems. It is used as a cream for itchiness due to atopic dermatitis or lichen simplex chronicus, man. That sounds like some shit you don't want to have. Man, you got to get on that fucking, uh, there's like Lunesta, and what's the other one? Ambien. You got to get on that Ambien, bro. Yeah. It's usually not the first line. Crystal says it's usually not the first line. Um, mm -hmm. see, if you can get, see if you can get upgraded to fucking Ambien. You, Lunesta and Ambien is like the last line of sleep defense. Well, no, it's, actually it's not. Valium is. <laughs> I take that back. No, um, one of the... Uh, I'm gonna point the microphone at her while she's saying it. You're live. Oh wow! Well, no, I was gonna say the insurance company actually rejected a non, um, like Lunesta or whatever, and the insurance company rejected my alternate medication because I needed to try the first line, which was Lunesta or Ambien. You heard it here first, folks. Okay. Get that Lunesta. You know, I will say that. First of all, I'm fascinated with medication names. I think they're beautiful and because I'm fascinated with big pharma. But like when I hear the name Lunesta, I want to go to sleep. It, like because it's derived from Luna, which means moon. It's just like Lunesta. Ah. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, ah. I don't even have to take it. I've also never taken it. I have taken Ambien on a flight from Korea and it was an unbelievable experience. It just sort of made me want to go to sleep. It didn't even make me feel like like... You know, like, James, some, some sleep stuff, like antihistamines, they just, like, crush you. They're just, like, like, pharma just yeah. pushes you down, and you like, can't even open your eyes. This was just, like, I was, like, yeah, I'm kind of sleepy. I closed my eyes. I woke up three and a half hours later. I was, like, what the fuck? Where the fuck was I? And then I went to go pee, because the medication was, like, seven-hour half-life. It's, like, super still, like, you know, in, a, in the blood. I felt normal, just a little tired. I peed because I was on a plane. I just peed out in the aisle because I don't use the plane bathrooms. I just pee wherever I want. <laughs> and then after I got back from the bathroom peeing, I laid down. And I was like, oh, I guess my sleep is over. Three and a half hours isn't bad. I, I closed my eyes and I woke up another three and a half hours later. I was like, whoa, holy fuck. Like it was really incredible. And after that, I didn't even have any like, I wasn't groggy or anything. I was really, really impressed. Yeah, I've never met somebody who has used those drugs and did not think that they were awesome. Not, and I don't mean that in like an abusive way. They just, like they had troubles, Tiger Woods, and no more. Now they're great. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's fucking sweet. Uh, all right, he says, maybe it helped a bit, uh, but just maybe and only a bit, so I'm not sure if it in reality gave any help, but I will try the ZMA. Yeah, that, that recommend- one's okay. It's, you know, like it will make, like I said, when you fall asleep, you're out cold. Uh, it doesn't help you sleep. Like it doesn't help you fall asleep, but when you do fall asleep, it's like pfft, gone. Pretty- you guys recommended taking two weeks of very light active rest followed by four times a week with a very low volume training and plenty of calories and focusing on sleep and falling uh, for a few months. Does this very low volume mean example four day a week MBT and using only the first uh, week's set numbers and only progressing in weight and lowering RIA throughout the muscle? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Number two, I've been thinking of doing front squats after many years. Mm, some coaches have said that front squats should be done only in short sets, maybe five to eight reps. Often, since often supporting muscles are the ones giving out first, causing the posture collapse. I think James and I were both those coaches. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I, yeah. What I conclude from this is that front squat isn't a very good hypertrophy exercise since the quads giving out first in the example earlier. Would front squats only be good for people who are strong on supporting muscles and have only quads as a limiting factor? Yes, they would definitely be better for those people. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your take on this? I don't think I'll be doing front squats since as a high-fatiguing exercise doesn't go well with easing on the training. Advice you gave me last week, smiley face, but I'm just asking out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, front squat, you know, people like, it's, it's interesting. If you just look at it from like a external view of like what the exercise looks like, people are like, front squats are great for quads. And it's like, yeah, are they though? Uh, and the answer is probably not. Like anything front squats can do, high bar close stance, upright squats with a heel can do probably better for quad hypertrophy purposes and probably for strength and probably for athletic development. To be honest, front squats are, and most weightlifters will tell you this, front squats are an exercise used to practice the front squat, which is a weightlifting movement like it, during the clean and jerk. Like weightlifters usually just use back squats to get stronger legs. So, you know. Yeah, I don't want to say too much and piss off front squatters, but it's a limited exercise. Front squat is great if you can do it at the same volume, intensity, frequency as your back squat. The problem is that the majority of people cannot do that. That's that's the thing. So if, as an exercise, it's, it's no different than anything else. If you can do it in such a way that is stimulative, then you'll get robust growth. The problem is that if more often than not, your lower back or your, your hips or your, your trunk muscles are going to be the limiting – or your – actually, I mean – even just the rack position is a limiting factor for many, many. Your people. shoulder joints are limiting, not even the muscles. You're like, yeah, you know, just so, fuck your shit up. And that, so you be, it's not that it's a bad exercise for hypertrophy per se. It's just a hard exercise to incorporate into hypertrophy training. That's really the limitation. If you can do it in, in a way that um, is not subject to those limitations, then it's it's going to be great. It would be like any other squ- a squatting movement at that point. It's just another variation, but it's not for most people. That's the problem. Yeah. Okie doke. Uh, and he says, I need to give you guys a shout out again for the help you're giving. It isn't, um, isn't it so cool how you have helped literally thousands of people. He helped hurt, you know, we're actually I was, trying to hurt people. We just I, keep fucking up and helping them instead. I always feel like we're just bullshitting. That's really what we're doing. It's, that's how it feels to me. And not to sound like indignant about it, but it, it, it's nice to hear when people say it's helpful. But like when we log on to these, I'm always like, Hey Mike, what's going on? Blah, 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 blah. You know, like it's, it's just mostly us shooting the shit for a little while. For sure. For sure. I'm glad you guys are getting something out of it. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoy. All right. It's Mar. Fuck. It's like, it's Mar. All right. Hi, Dr. Mike and uh, Dr. James and Dr. Mike. If Mike wants to guess where I'm from, quick tip. The name of the country has an and has a and oh serbia in, and uh, wait wait something no oh, something uh, in montenegro hmm hold up this is bothering me it has an and there's isn't there two countries in the caribbean that are usually uh, yeah, Trinidad not, and Tobago. Yeah, he's not from that. But that's, so they're still two separate company, so I can, countries. So I guarantee you he's from Eastern Europe. Um, let's see. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Those aren't two separate things now? That's, it's one country. Oh. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Everyone who has that, anything Ovic, Ovic is, is uh, from that area of the world. All right. Which, All by right. the way, is populated mostly by like six foot, t- six foot five tall models. People look absurd. Oh, They're yeah. better at every sport than everyone else. Fuck all you guys for being better than us. That's what <laughs> I tell you. All right. Also, their country's fucking gorgeous. Like, yeah. All right. It's not like Philadelphia where people are not six foot five models and Philadelphia is not gorgeous. 
Or good at a lot of things. Or good at most things. <laughs> I just, uh, I have just six questions. Uh, I feel they belong more in sports scientists. Speaking of, when is the new podcast coming out? Fuck if I know. Does you mean the new sports scientist episode? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. We haven't recorded one. Sports, I don't, don't, don't you worry about when that's coming out. It'll come out sporadically when Marcos decides he, he wants to do a sports scientist. <laughs> um, number two, how does joint crackling, cracking affect lifting? Seems to me that it's uh, psychological. For instance, if I crack my neck, it feels more free. I can crack my neck several times a day, but sometimes maybe once a week, my right shoulder feels weird. It pulls and I can pop it into place. I should add that my right shoulder is fucked up from unnecessary grinding. Long story short, turns out to be my uh, psychological ache I was feeling. Huh? For instance, when I do military press, my shoulder blades don't elevate to the same height. Um, I think that you got to do whatever makes you feel comfortable and whatever kind of swag you got going on. It's probably just very largely psychological. There might be some cracking. There's cracking as a displacement of uh, oftentimes of like internal joint gases, I believe. Uh, and there might be something to aligning the joints a little bit more optimally for cracking or post cracking. My, my wife, who's a sports medicine doctor, says yes. Um, so, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I would definitely get all your cracks out before you lift heavy. The hilarious thing is that when you start lifting heavy, the cracks come out anyway. I would just prefer they come out before the lift than during. Like if I like, I'll, uh, if I squeeze my glutes together, I can actually crack my lower spine area, like my sacrum and stuff. If that happens during the lift, I'm like, holy fuck, did I fall apart? <laughs> but if it happens before, I'm like, ah, I'm okay. Yeah, I think that's just something you can incorporate into like an individualized warm up, like just kind of your pre-lifting routine for any given day or sessions or movements that you're going to do. I think that's fine, but I don't think it, there's much to it outside of just uh, individualization. Yeah. Number three, you mentioned that large amounts of fruit post workout wasn't recommended since uh, it's strawberry season. We have a bunch of them, and sometimes I pull a lot of them in my post workout shake. How much is too much? Two hundred grams of strawberries. What we said is like. Um, well, I don't know, mention that large amounts of fruit post workout. Like, uh, we don't want you to blend 50 trillion different fruits, super concentrate them, and then eat them. But if you're having a shake full of strawberries, like, the number of strawberries you have to eat in order to shut down muscle growth from their antioxidants is like more than you could possibly eat. We don't want you to do yeah. like fruit extracts and vitamins and stuff like that. And today, my post workout meal was a protein shake and uh, 130 grams of carbs from melon. Like, I had two giant bowls of, of honeydew melon. Like I'm not worried about muscle loss from that. So no realistic amount of strawberries and eat up. Yeah. And the only thing I would think was uh, like, there's a, it's probably some fiber limitations too, depending on which fruits and stuff you're eating. You might not want to be blasting like a huge fiber dose after uh, your workout. That might make you a little, little, get a little rumble in your tumble. But other than that, totally good. In your tumble. You're small. Arnold comes out and always like, oh, dude, look at you. <laughs> You've been eating this too many strawberries. I'm telling you, stop eating this fruit. Stop it. <laughs> Exactly. You like got a strawberry in your hand. He knocks it out of your hand. He's like, "Get the fuck out of here." Mel doesn't like it when I eat fruit because I get real gassy. Man, Mel's got a problem. If she's got a problem with you getting gassy, because you're like the origin of all gas in the universe. I know. I've been real bad. You know, like sometimes I wake up and and the room just smells like eggs, and I just know that I've been just letting it rip all night. You know. Oh yeah, that's awful, dude. I'm gonna I'm tell you, man. When my kids, like my eventual kids, go to school, they're gonna come back and be like, "Mommy, Daddy, I heard that intergalactic collisions caused the formation of gas, and that worked to planets." I'm like, "That's bullshit. Your school's lying. Your Uncle James is the one that made all the gas in the world." Like, but that doesn't sound. Shut up. And yeah. like, <laughs> he hit me last time when he was over. <laughs> like, good. He'll be make probably deserved it. <laughs> I'm, I'm a girl. We'll, we'll make a woman out of you. God damn it. I don't know. What he's doing is right because he's Mr. Gas. It's Mr. Gas. I like that. I have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, another WI cold water immersion blunts muscle growth. But why is Wim Hof so jacked? Well, I can answer that a couple of ways. Wim Hof's not that jacked. Uh, second answer <laughs> is genetic variations a motherfucker, and he probably trains a lot. And he would be more jacked if he didn't do cold water immersion. Also, the cold water immersion. Blunting effect of hypertrophy is notable, but small. He probably got to his current level of jackness pre-cold water immersion. Yeah, not from cold water immersion. And then he says, JK, what are your... <laughs> Actually, it, 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 truth be told, huh? yeah. Wim Hof's not, not very jacked at all. But he does cool breathing shit. Uh, what are your opinions on cold showers after workouts and or in the morning far from the workout? Uh, would you say it has the same effect as CD by? So for James... Hit that, hit it. Uh, no, the, I mean, it's, it's not a huge deal at all. Uh, I would say normally for, first of all, for cold to even really be 
a detriment to hypertrophy or to any kind of like anabolism or recovery type stuff, you have to actually have enough cold exposure in terms of um, time and the degree of coldness so that it can actually penetrate down deep into the muscle. So that means you have to have enough cold exposure so that it goes through the superficial part of your, you know, your skin and actually deep into the muscle where it actually starts to have more of an effect. Cold showers are, are not even going to be remotely close to having any of that type of effect. In the ice bath, you have so much surface area coverage and you can make it so cold. That's when it starts to become more of a thing. But for a shower, I, I honestly don't even, I, you would be hard pressed I would be hard pressed to think that a cold shower would have any of those types of effects, if at all. Agreed. It's just, it's just as not long enough. As you don't stand there and get super fucking cold. Yeah. I think you probably, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I don't have a strong opinion on that, but I don't think it has the, the penetrating power to <laughs> affect the muscle enough. <laughs> I heard that about exactly. you, James. Mm-hmm. Not the penetrating power. Yeah. Luckily, Mel doesn't mind so much. <laughs> Number five, in one of the RP lectures regarding rest, Mike mentions that you should start your next session when all check boxes are checked, CNS, respiratory, etc. Let's say that I check those boxes after 90 seconds of my reps are 18, 13, 11. When I rest 120 seconds of the same exercises, my reps are 18, 15, 12. Yes, we don't count reps as our volume. We count sets. With that being said, we have the same load but more reps in the 120 second rest example, meaning more volume load. Are, uh, are these couple of reps irrelevant if we just stick to one rest time? Do they wash out if we use the same rest time and focus on progressing over time? Um, I think that they definitely wash out. I think that you will get a much slightly tiny bit more hypertrophic stimulus if you rest longer. But is it worth resting way more time to get this like 1% boost in hypertrophy? No, especially because instead of resting, you can just do another mini set, save tons of time anyway, and get even more growth. Right. So at the end of the day, there's a trade off between how much you rest versus just doing another set. Here's the thing. After you check those four check boxes, growth is so similar between any sets you do after, be it right after or minutes after, that it's just not worth waiting in almost any circumstances. And if it is worth waiting, it's worth just doing another set and getting even more out of it. Yeah, totally. And this is just, I would say, favor consistency in this case like whatever you do for your exercises just keep doing it there's no incentive to change it unless you unless you're just experimenting and that's perfectly fine but even then you would experiment by changing it in a consistent way across a mesocycle or two not just one session so consistency can't can't and we prefer like internal consistency to the effect of once all four boxes are checked go once four boxes are checked go that way it's easy to track MRV and performance over the weeks because you know that if your performance starts to dip, it's not because you're resting less or resting more. It's you're resting always relatively to your performance. And once you're good to go, you're good to go. So that way it standardizes the rest time. It's, it's this miracle of standardization with auto-regulation. Like, because over-standardization means you might not be ready to go, but you go anywhere. Like, all oh, two minutes is up, even though I'm breathing heavy. But if you wait for the four check boxes to clear, and then you go right after they're cleared, then it is a form of standardization, but also auto-regulated each workout. So it's a really, really good mix. And this is, and I'm not trying to be dismissive of your question here at all. That's not my intent, but I feel like the rest times thing, I don't know if it's just like a recent thing where people have been really particular about the rest times. Guys, this is like such a minutia, really. It's, it's one of these things like... Uh, it's easily fixed by just auto-regulating your rest times if you don't want to think about it more critically. I mean, think, think thinking about it and being thoughtful with your training and using the box check system is a really good way to do it. And that's how I recommend it. But at the same time, are you going to have terrible training if you are not doing that? Like probably not. You probably get pretty good training too. I, I, don't, I don't think, um, what I'm thinking, I think what I imagine people doing is using rest times and things like RIR as an excuse to, I don't know. It just feel, it feels like it's an unnecessary constraint on themselves to just do sure. hard training sometimes. Sure. You know what I mean? It's like, an, it's like a mathematical excuse to not just do more. At, sometimes, at some yeah. It's, uh, it's just the answer is when you're ready, you feel like you're ready to do another hard set, fucking hit it. Yeah, if hit you're it. waiting a long time after you've been already ready, stop fucking doing that. And don't perseverate over things like rest times. <laughs> it's just not worth, not worth fussing about that much. It's mostly a wash. Consistency greater than anything else. Number six, the book Spark by John Rady concludes that around 20 minutes of cardio boosts mental capacity. Okay. It doesn't. I'll tell you why in a sec. What does literature say about lifting heavy shit in the gym and the effect on our brain? I intrinsically know uh, what the sport has done to my mental state, but I'm curious to know what has been proven. So the thing is, is like these studies that are being cited in these books, 
that 20 minutes of cardio boosts mental capacity. There's just in, in, incredibly shitty external validity on all fronts. Uh, you know, you have to ask the nature of the studies, like 20 minutes of cardio boosts performance on an IQ test. Well, that may be because it just gets the juices flowing a little bit. Maybe 20 minutes of more lively alert. conversation. Yeah. Live, 20 minutes of lively conversation might do the same thing. It might even do better. Um, you know, so it, it boosts mental capacity for how long? You know, what if you just started doing stuff and after 20 minutes, your mental capacity was just as high as you've been doing cardio, but you already got some work done. So your mental capacity has an on-ramp effect that may be accomplished by cardio or maybe accomplished by doing slightly sim more simple tasks. For example, instead of doing 20 minutes of cardio and then getting heavy intellectual work done, why not just do 20 minutes of checking emails and you actually get something done work-wise instead of just pissing away time doing cardio. And then by 20 minutes of working on emails, your brain is already at max capacity and you get that boost. And then you go to your heavy lifting, your actual work before you do very intellectually demanding things. So a lot of these studies on like exercise, good for brain, like they're just really throw away fucking studies. Eat a good meal, make sure you're nice and energized. If you feel like a walk around the block or two, it boosts your mental capacity. Great. For many people, it does. For some people, it doesn't. And for many people, just calmly getting into the work and slowly building up work effort over time and then taking breaks after that and doing more work is really just the way to go. What does lifting do about the brain? It doesn't affect your brain fucking one way or the other. All the effects are transient. It's not bad for the brain. It's not good for the brain. Exercise in general seems to be good for long-term brain uh, development and health and all this other stuff, but lifting probably has no special effect. So I just, this is uh, to, 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 to beat James at his own game here. This is something I would look at even less than rest times. And again, we don't mean uh, to, to demean you in any way. This is a very, very good, very legitimate question, but the answer is it really just not a fucking hill of beans difference between any of these shits. So, you know, do what you do intellectually. And if you feel like lifting really helps you be sharp, lift before you do your intellectual shit. But if, if you don't, don't be surprised. Be like, Oh, I thought it was supposed to boost it. Like these are not results that can be replicated uh, unanimously among all people. Yeah. And there's a couple other confounders too. So using the cardio and the walking as an example, that's one that's been studied a lot. And one that is something that does seem to be very true is that taking a, a brief walk uh, is very positive for your mental state. So it tends to increase your mood, uh, make your mood and affect more positive, which is good, which can be misconstrued to thinking that you are more in a higher mental state or higher capacity. And um, you also just are raising your level of physical arousal at that point, right? So anytime your arousal goes up, you're going to be a little bit sharper at some of the things that you're doing. That just is just a natural, that's why you warm up for sports. That's why mm. we do all, all sorts of stuff. So I wouldn't put too much stock into it. I know that there's been a lot going around recently and I'm not, my, my wife is a neuroscientist. I certainly am not. I know there's been a lot of stuff going around lately about lifting and, and, and seems to prevent uh, Alzheimer's disease and some other stuff. But I, man, I don't know about any of that. I think it's mostly about like living a, a good, healthy lifestyle yeah. is what, what mitigates a lot of the risk factors and, you know, things like yeah. that. Oh, that's got something to say. It um, seems to be very related to maintaining healthy blood flow and healthy vascular system. Mm. So um, exercise and good diet contribute risk for a lot of dementia and stroke and all the, all the brain-related blood. Did you hear that? Yeah, that's pretty clear, actually. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Can you ask Mel to stay in her lane, please? Mel, uh, you need to stay in your lane. <laughs> that is my lane. <laughs> no, Our no. Out of my lane, <laughs> okay, can you just do one more? James, can you tell me? Can you say to Mel, Mel, can you just like, um, just like not? Mel, can you just like... Just, just, just like not. Is that from Mike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's shaking her head like. <laughs> oh, job of the Hutt's assistant. Oh, monkey all right. Slash, uh, what is that thing? Mo parrot monkey. Parrot worms frog thing. Whatever. Ugh. I love that thing. That's my spirit animal. Uh, and then Ismata says, thank you guys. Uh, thank you very much for everything you gave, are giving, and willing to give us. Oh, I've got something to give oh, you, Ismata. Oh, so boy. X going to give it to you. That's right. I wish I could hug you guys. Well, we wish we could hug you back. Six feet, bro. Um, yes. So, James, let's cut this one off now. We'll pick up tomorrow at Hayden Dunn, and tomorrow we'll hit up YouTube as well. Okay, that sounds good. I, I put a mark on my thing to remind me where we left off. Folks, thanks for tuning in with us today. We didn't get through all the questions, but we will address the rest of the questions uh, probably sometime very soon this week. Keep subscribing to the RP YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. There's tons of good stuff. Mike actually just posted a, a bunch of videos. Like I think there was a, some back ones recently. And oh, boy. We've got a bunch ton. of stuff. Uh, RP podcast going strong. So subscribe and keep asking those great questions. We will see you next time.
You're serious about your goals and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. Folks, we're back. Part two of the weekly webinar. We had a fuckload of questions this week. That's right. I dropped the F-bomb. And we didn't finish last time, so we're going to finish this time. Dr. Mike, shall we just get right to it? Let's get right into it. Inside it. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Let me bring up the YouTube stuff for later. What was the video? Video was uh, webinar with Mike and James. Okie doke. Now that I have that brought up, let us get into Hayden Dunn. Hayden Dunn has a couple of great questions. He says, I had a few clarifying points about my question from last week about rep ranges for each microcycle. I was interested to see what would change uh, if that would change answers in any way. For a refresher, you all recommended that for four days a week, I spend one day in the 5 to 10 range, one in the 10 to 15, one in the 15 to 20, and one in the 20 to 30. I understood the rationale, but I wanted to apply this to other factors I don't believe I was clear on. I will be running 12 sessions a week mesocycle, so six days a week and two sessions a day based on the 12-session template Dr. Mike put, so here are the questions that come with that. Since I'm doing six days a week as opposed to four, should I spend two days in each rep range? No, because the 12 session mesocycle that I wrote is actually only four sessions per muscle group per week. So it's actually exactly what we told you. But yeah, what's the confusion? So, wait. so, th so I is think he trying to expand the, like the, the idea of four into six days a week? Is that? I think it's so, so for the mesocycle he's running, it's only four sessions per muscle group. But we can answer a more general theoretical question of if you have X number of days, how should you split up the rep ranges? And honestly, the best answer you get from us is like, you know, first point, relatively evenly. So like if you have three days, it's one day, five to 10, one day, 10 to 20, one day, 20 to 30. Second point, biased towards your best SFRs. So if you really respond well in the five to 10 range for any given muscle groups, you might want to have two days of that and only two days of the other two ranges combined. So like five to 10, then five to 10, then 10 to 20, then 20 to 30. If you, like most people, respond best to the 10 to 20 range, you should have more days of 10 to 20. So, for example, let's say you're training five days a week. First day could be 5 to 10. Second day can be 10 to 20. Third day can be 10 to 20. Fourth day can be 10 to 20. And then fifth day can be 20 to 30, right? Uh, or if you respond really well to 20 to 30, which is usually is pretty unusual, then you can do more days of that. But generally speaking, there are no hard <coughs> <laughs> there are no, that was awesome. That was there are no hard rules, right? It's just a spectrum and you want to bias the spectrum to, in two factors, two ways. One, you want a good spread and two, you want to bias towards your best SFRs and that's going to be different for every muscle group. So like for hamstrings, you know, I essentially have like, usually it's mostly five to 10 and a little bit of like, you know, sometimes 10 to 20, but I almost never go 20 to 30 with hamstrings. Sometimes I do and that's not for very long. So it's one of the situations where uh, it's really going to be based on the muscle group, but in general, you go from heavier to lighter all the way through the week, and uh, and that's that. Yeah, and I think that came up on uh, last week's webinar, too, at some point. Maybe it was yep. the same question. Yeah. And then he says, should I still progress through the week, beginning at lower rep ranges and moving my way up and scatter these rep ranges throughout, as long as each body part is getting some exposure to all of the different rep ranges? So, um, there is a, so, so what you want to do is for any given muscle group, it should probably go wherever you start with five to 10. It could be in the middle of the week. It goes heavier to moderate to light. And then there should be some distinct period of longer than usual rest. And then it goes back to heavy again. Okay. Now that means you can start like legs could be Monday heavy, but like maybe you do chest on Wednesday first. So you might do chest Wednesday heavy and then Friday moderate. And then Saturday or something, let's say Sunday you do chest. It could be light. And then Sunday to Wednesday is a nice big rest. So that, that's how that would probably work. So what we'd really say is for any given muscle group, make sure that it proceeds in heaviest to lightest followed by if you take whatever ASA, because we always recommend a little bit of asymmetry in the programming in the, within the week. Like there should be a more distinct rest-ish time with a little bit more rest. We recommend that that occurs after the lightest session. Um, so that way you're really, really overly recovered 
for the heaviest session, which is what you need to be recovered for. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Mike here. And I think the only, the only issue I had was just maybe the phrasing where it moved my way up or scatter these rep ranges throughout. Like, so you don't want to scatter them. You generally want to follow the, the pattern Dr. Mike said. There are going to be instances where, like if you do heavy push on Monday, you might have some other muscle groups like biceps, for example, that you might be doing training light. But really, we want for the, for the major, the big compound movements or any of the big major muscle groups, we want to find that pattern as much as we can throughout the week. And sometimes for the accessory movements, you'll find yourself doing 20 to 30 maybe on Monday, on day one. But you're going to have a heavier session coming up later in the week. Yep. 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 What you definitely don't want to do is have like the week go from light to heavy because that just makes no right. sense. <laughs> you, will quickly, you will quickly find out that that makes no sense. <laughs> um, number three, since this specific template lays out, layout spreads the entire body out very well, evenly and consistently. Would this protect me from extreme intercession systemic fatigue if I were to complete days in a specific rep range. Do complete days in a specific rep range. Example, doing two days where every exercise is 5 to 10 or 20 to 30 range. Actually, yes. And in fact, this template that, that I made uh, is so high frequency that the per session volume is really small. So you probably only need usually one exercise per session. And one exercise you can absolutely do in one range. So that's totally, totally fine. Um, and that's the rest of the question is to that end. So yeah, absolutely. And, and, and now you guys can start to see the benefits of uh, smaller sessions, but more frequent sessions, is that you can really send a very clear message with a given session. Um, and you don't have to worry a ton about session to session fatigue or intra-session fatigue rather. That's why you know, James and I were asked like the famous question that we made fun of about a trillion times now, like, hey, how come you guys don't have two a day, two, two session per week advanced hypertrophy splits? And we're like, <laughs> Well, we don't write six-hour workouts, man. How far are you aren't advanced? That's right, ex exactly. So, you know, are 12 sessions appropriate for everyone? No, absolutely not. And you will deal with lots of problems with a 12-session routine that make it very unsustainable for anything more than about a mesocycle. But one of those problems will not be that your intra-session fatigue is very high. In fact, you will get great, great workouts. The big problem is that your workouts are so great, you're going to get fucked up doing that many great workouts within a period of a mesocycle. So. Yeah, and uh, the only thing I would add on this one is uh, – I can't tell if he meant like if he was applying those rep ranges rigidly across all muscle groups for the session or if he just meant for like the, the whatever muscle that he was training within the Good session. Good question. Good question. So, so the James, that's an excellent point. Our response to that is probably like just focus on one muscle group at a time. So if you have a situation where one muscle group is 5 to 10 and another muscle group later in that session is 10 to 20 or 20 to 30, that's actually great. And as a matter of fact, that's, that's better than having an entire day of 5 to 10 yes. because you can only really have one, maybe two exercises in the 5 to 10 range before you are too weak to capitalize on that range and just smashing more volume is a better idea. So it, yeah. your session should go each session. If you have three exercises, should go like 5 to 10, then 15 to 20, uh, or sorry, then 10 to 15, then 15 to 20 or something like that. You know, if it's 10 to 20, then you do 10 to 20, 10 to 20, then 20 to 30, right? You, you're gonna, you don't, you don't ever want to go lighter to heavier in a session. That's really, really stupid. Yeah. That was my only concern there. And I think, I think if he meant just for, with for the, for the muscle groups in question, then that's fine. But if it's for rigidly across all, all things being trained for that day, that's probably not a good strategy because then you're just going to lose opportunities for good programming throughout the week. Mm hundred -hmm, percent. And then the, the muscle groups just interfere with each other a lot. And then he says another question. He says he saw someone talk about James's arm specializ specialization cycle and heard him talking about drudging through crazy high volume. I didn't know if James had ever put the specifics of the program or not. I was very interested to look into that. Uh, there's nothing really all that interesting. It's, it's frankly, it, I mean, I could put it out there, but you guys would be probably just disappointed. The only thing that was interesting was that I was doing a mass phase and I'm like a high, high volume tolerance type person and I auto-regulated until I felt, you know, my, my performance was hitting my MRVs. And so for me, that just, I mean, it was just a, a, a arm specialization, delt specialization phase where I was just training arm, some element of arms almost every day. And so it ended up being like biceps ended up being like five times per week. I think tries were like four and there was some delt movement. It wasn't always lateral delts or front delts or rear delts, but there was some delt movement basically every day. And I tried to do them in a way that was non-overlapping or didn't interfere too much with each other. And I just went until... My performance went down. And for me, that just meant I was doing like 50 sets towards the end. And it's, it's not all that interesting. And in fact, you'd probably look at it and be like, he's doing this at home workout. He's doing seven sets of, you know, easy curls. And then, you know, another seven sets of reverse curls. And then, you know, it's, I could write it down. I could show you guys, but honestly, it's not that exciting. It's just an issue of specialization, massing and auto regulation. And for me, I'm just like a high volume person. And that's just how it worked out. All right. He says, sign up for as a Corona test subject if need be. <laughs> awesome. Right on. 
And then some more questions. You touched on super compensation in terms of actual muscle fiber size last week and how long it may actually take to occur. I've always known the research and uh, uh, countless anecdotal examples of strength portion of super compensation, but I'm not able to find resources on the hypertrophy side of this. Number one, what are some studies that you would like, you would recommend a reading to look into? Well, actually, a bit better than a study, just uh, Google the first clear evidence of delayed hypertrophic super compensation written by Greg Knuckles on April 20th and the Stronger by Science, a great website that you should be looking at anyway. And Greg does better than just one study. He talks about a bunch of the studies that have been written. So there's, that, your, there's your end. That's kind of an important take home that you just hit on there. Like, so it's very rare that Mike and I will ever recommend any single studies for you guys to read on anything. And it's very rare that we would even remember, even if there was like a meta analysis or a review article, I mean, like I wouldn't remember that shit off the top of my head. I would have to go back and I probably saved it somewhere and I'd have to go back and find it. But like, there's no, just in this, I'm not trying to, trying to, trying to knock you here, but this is just one of those things. Like if you ask for a single study, like we're, it's just, we're never going to tell you because a, we don't think that's a good way of going about learning yeah. and B, um, we're just not going to remember that shit. It's, I, this, this Mike gets this more than I do, but people will be like, did you see the paper 2018 by dildo at all? And I'm like, I don't, I maybe, I don't remember. Do you know how many yeah. fucking papers I've looked at over the years, guys? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. And somebody would be like, well, they had a, they said something different to something that you said. I'm like, okay, great. I honestly, like we've looked uh, at man. as much as we can when we talk about something. I know. I knew people in, uh, in grad school and I've had professors that would name drop people's, uh, first and last name in their studies. And, and they would also say things like, because it's really like you get to wag your dick about how fucking in the know you are. They'd be like, <laughs> yes. this, uh, and, and this, uh, this comes out of Helmut's lab. And like, oh, wow, it's out of his lab. Like it's published in his lab. Let me ask you, other than to fucking radically bias yourself, how is that relevant? Like, it fucking matter where it came from. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't matter. Because the, fundamentally, you shouldn't care. It's all data. You're like, oh, it came out of fucking this and that guy's lab, so it's got to be like, oh, wow, you're so cool. You know all of the scientists. Like, rub their fucking jizz off your lip for the love of God. Agreed. All right. Number two. For you all, anecdotally, have you ever experienced delayed muscle growth other than immediate glycogen replenishment? If so, how long after meso? No clue. Uh, such growth is so small as to be indetectable, and yeah. it's very difficult to experience any kind of growth from anything that you know is distinctly from some of that thing. Yeah, and I, th I think there's evidence, like, very, this is very anecdotal evidence of that. You know, when we, when we make jokes about, like, old man strength, stuff like that, like, that's evidence of, like, a long, t like a long time coming, someone who has been doing physical activity and accruing muscle mass over a long period of time that maybe was transient over several months or years from a stimulus that they had gotten from a long time ago. Maybe, but there's no way that, like, Mike and I could ever say that, like, oh, yeah, we um, – for sure gained muscle on this cut that we did that manifested six months later in the subsequent mass phase. Like this, there's no way that we can possibly confirm or deny. Yeah. It says, uh, are these size differences noticed normally after or during a deload or longer times of lower volume? Again, no clue. It's, it's impossible to, you know, you can notice size. It is very difficult to say what it came from. Number four, does any of this research possibly lead uh, to believing that taking longer bouts of training in a deload or resensitization phase that we originally thought. Not yet, but there's some hints that maybe that could work. Um, and then number five, do you believe these size realizations come after mesocycles taking place in hypo, iso, or hypercaloric states or just one of them? I have a suspicion they take place in all of the states. I've seen people uh, do really hard training during hypocaloric diets, clearly just lose weight the entire time. And then when they end those diets and begin massing, they get really crazy all time PRs really, really fast into a mass. Yes. And you're like, wow, there's no way that your strength converts so quick from gaining muscle in the last week. <laughs> so something definitely happened and they look bigger and leaner than every, than, than they have once they fill out with glycogen. So yeah, over the course of an entire fat loss phase, I have seen people make what are essentially muscle gains out. I don't know if that's really delayed supercompensation or if they've been gaining muscle the entire time, but the, but the fluid component of muscle was really sort of like downplayed. Uh, who knows? But, uh, or just like the mm -hmm. phenotypic expression of the muscle that they gain from all the hard training maybe now comes to manifest in better energy conditions. Who knows? There's like so many <laughs> things. It's hard to put it. Sure. Yeah. And he says, hopefully I have anecdotal evidence myself coming to the end of this mass or possibly even mastering upcoming deload. Uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck teasing that apart. Thank you, kind sirs. Gains be with you. You as well. All right. Kyle Minchow says, hello, docs. Rugby scumbag here. Yeah. 
Barf. Apologies ahead of time for a very long question. However, I want to make sure I cover all my bases. I'm a firm believer that if a client can perform a full range of motion uh, safely without pain and while maintaining good mind and muscle connection, achieving a pump and muscle disruption, checking all the boxes of stimulus to fatigue ratio, and the given exercise has specificity to the individual's goals, that it is encouraged to perform that full range of motion, especially in terms of hypertrophy. I understand that in power, strength, and speed training... Fuck. Um, hold on a sec. One sec. I got to write something down. Uh-oh. Note to self. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Mike's like, note to self, full range of motion. I'm like, what the fuck? Post uh, leg press video. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I'm, I'm going to make a video right off this topic. Uh, and the video will be called the case against full ROM because there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people who present various cases against full range of motion. And some of them have decent uh, in, input and some of them are just total garbage. So we're basically going to be a dissection video, but in any case, let's do a preview of that video now. Um, Okay, and he says, uh, in especially in terms of hypertrophy, I understand that in power, strength, and speed training, there can be great benefits to limiting range of motion, such as specifically for powerlifting. It would be more beneficial to train the competition range of motion for the squat, where your strength and power phases instead of ass to grass. I try to keep an open mind to new ideas and concepts, especially those proposed with individuals with PhDs in the exercise field. That being said, I've run into a lot of confusion when looking at a lot of Joel Seedman's PhD in kinesiology ideas behind the optimal squat. You're not the first to run into confusion. James, have you ever seen Joel Seedman's Instagram? I, I have seen his stuff, though I admit that I've been trying to not be on social media as much the last couple of years, so I'm not like in the know on a lot of these things. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible in every way you could think. Uh, and he goes, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have taught for many years that not all squats will look the same for various reasons, whether that be limb proportion, goals, mobility restrictions, et cetera. I read Joel Seedman's 100 squat truths. Wow. That's a lot of squat truths. I don't think I know that. I don't even, yeah, I was gonna say, I don't even know if I have the hundred points to discuss on the right. squat where he explains why everyone should squat the same. I got more and more skeptical of these truths um, with each one. As I read, as he emphasized proper 90 degree squats, maximize hypertrophy. Uh, it's by the way, not uh, evidence from the li literature and it's actually counter evidence from literature, but uh, continue on. There's more muscle activation by stopping at 90 degrees, also false. Knee should not track over your toes in the squat, false. And that squatting ass to grass is good if your training goals are decreased strength, increased joint pain, degradations to natural body mechanics, herniated discs, sciatic issues, chronic lower back pain, blown out knees. You know, this is where I would recommend you go look at barbell <laughs> medicine is, stuff. This is like, like the antithesis of what the full range of mo like this is what yeah. partial range of motion gets you. For it's sure. So funny, like it's like t yeah. literally the opposite. Yeah, something. So I've I've actually had at uh, you know public debates with the barbell medicine folks uh, about them. Essentially, I don't think they're injury averse enough, and they're too brazen with the recommendations. But they are an excellent because they make a lot of great points. They're an excellent counterbalance to this kind of thinking. Like there's all kinds of people that like Joe Seaman that say if you don't do something exactly this way, you're just gonna fucking die. The body is highly fucking resilient. First of all, and second of all, like James said, it's probably better to do a full range of motion to get all this kind of stuff. Um, I think like you could make a case for strength, certainly. Like uh, if you, this is just a specificity issue, right? Like if you emphasize time. a certain range of motion, then you, you get stronger in that range of motion, right? But yeah. there's nothing that says that you can't do full range of motion and get stronger and then maybe even translate that into partial yes. range of motion. Later. Yes, much better one way than the other way, actually. Yeah. It's much better, to, it's much easier to learn how to do a partial after you can do the full uh, versus the other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. Trust me. You want to be squatting too deep when your powerlifting prep starts rather than too shallow. <laughs> um, Very good point. And then he says, he goes on to list multiple uh, of more, all of which, if squatting with proper astrograss technique in a controlled manner, I disagree with. Over my years of lifting and training, I have found a lot of benefits and success with increasing ankle, hip, and thoracic spine mobility uh, in order to squat in a much larger range of motion. I've also emphasized the full range of motion of the squat can improve joint health when performed correctly, specifically to hypertrophy. I believe that loaded eccentric contractions is very beneficial to muscle growth in a full range of motion. I constantly I, strive to... Sorry, just want to jump in real quick. So I, I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy, for the most part. But I also find that people spend too much time uh, pursuing mobility in, the, in, in these instances yeah. for its own sake. Whereas what I have found, and I think Dr. Mike will largely agree, is once you start training full, full range of motion, those things tend to start working themselves on their own. And that over months and months and years and years of training, you got all the mobility you need. And then I think a lot of people just take it to the nth degree where they say, I'm doing training for mobility in the squat, right? It's like, okay, well, you could have just, you could just train the squat and skip yeah. all that and you're good. You know what I mean? Yeah. So don't, that's just one issue I have with that. But other than that, you're, you're right on point. 100%, 100%. Um, he says, I constantly strive to improve my training skills and don't want to throw Dr. Seedman under the bus. I would love to hear both of your thoughts on these squat truths. 
uh, uh, I'm want us to go through all, all 100 of those squat truths. It probably wouldn't be that hard. It'd be like, bullshit, bullshit, <laughs> no, bullshit, no, wrong. No. <laughs> and what science would promote or discourage these teachings? Thanks for all the help and knowledge. Well, so the, the actual science on that, which, which I'm quite, quite familiar with, and so is James, is that uh, essentially nothing he said. So, so his, his uh, pronouncements about the squats is almost exclusively fall into two categories. One, demonstrably false via research and biomechanics inference. And two, make belief that has no basis in reality. Like, at best, the things he said are like, uh, maybe 50-50 chance of that being true. But if you're asserting a 50-50 chance is 100, you're making a 50% categorical error. Uh, it's like telling someone like, you know, 50-50 chance in cards. You're like, you're going to win every time. <laughs> like, well, that's ballsy. He's like Trump, right? Like at best, he's batting 50% and then... Exactly. Yeah. And Whatever worst, else comes it's next. It's literally just like it's either it's either make make belief that no one can 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 justify or it's wrong. So so unfortunately, Dr. Joel Seedman is uh, is is uh, how would I say? I would say his best role in the fitness industry, if I was being charitable, is as a skeptical as a skeptic uh, uh, saw sharpener. Like that, you go to his shit to see how good your skeptical science swag is and how much you know. So I would do is read his posts and see if you can refute most of these things in your head with knowledge of studies and biomechanics and physiology um and think of like with the polite questions you would ask him if you were in a formal debate with him like so you said that is this bad for knee health you know is it are we to understand that there's literature uh describing how this happens and or so describing that this happens and then your next question would be like okay so i guess we're just going on biomechanical inference okay so i'm under the impression that biomechanics actually implies that knee health is fine through a variety of ranges of motion and here's a paper summarizing that in biomechanics journal what do you think of this and like, I, I don't imagine he was going to answer these in a very convincing way um i'll tell you that there's like this you know like um sort of mild consensus of folks on the big issues like uh you know brad schoenfeld james krieger greg knuckles menno henselmans and you know eric helms and all these guys I guess I'm in that like little group of people and uh, none of know. those people, could, well, you didn't, you don't want to be a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> we, we offered you fame and you swatted it out. Um, hey, get out of here. Get out of here. Uh, <laughs> like uh, Christina Aguilera monsters. <laughs> <laughs> get out of here. So great. Uh, I love that. She like the Christina Aguilera spider crawled up. And the only thing she said was <laughs> <laughs> get out of here. Christina Aguilera monster. South Park has made me laugh so hard. I thought it was dying at various points. Uh, where where do they, they come been, up with this shit? Where yeah, have they who been knows? with all this COVID stuff? I think they're going to drop like a COVID bomb. I think like yeah, oh, for sure. once this kind of dies down all the way, I think good. they're going to just unload something. It's too good. So that whole like whatever evidence-based community like m consensus on the basics, none of those people, I literally mean none, would ever consider what Seidman is saying remotely close to the truth. It's not like nuanced where like, you know, the barbell medicine guys have very interesting views about injury risk. They could be right. They could be wrong. They're certainly very intelligent. They're very well read on the literature. They present their views very eloquently. I think they're a little bit more wrong on some things and a little bit more right on others. And there's some disagreement within the field. Uh, but, but for Joel Seidman, there's, there's none of that. Okay. So just, you know, and, I, and that doesn't mean much. So at the end of the day, we could all be wrong and he could be right. But, um, you know, he'd be hard pressed to support his position eloquently. I'll put it that way. Um, if you got yeah. someone, if you convince someone really smart that he's correct, that also knows their shit, uh, you, good God, uh, message Brad Schoenfeld and ask him, please don't do that. Brad will get a fucking heart attack if you do that. Um, it'd be tough, real tough, yeah. real uphill. I mean, even on the knee health one, I remember uh, since before I was teaching at Temple, I had a great review article that, that was uh, overviewed like the, the depth and biomechanics of squatting and yep. it clearly show the full range of motion was better than none. And it was, so I'm assuming I haven't looked at it for a little while, but I'm assuming it's probably even more information on that since then. Cause that was probably a paper from, I guess eight years ago or something. Well, that was out of uh, Rosenberg's lab, right? James, he's a great guy. You know? Fuck if I know, but I'm sure there's more papers since then and more reviews and meta-analyses yeah. that show the same. All right. So, uh, Fionn R. So uh, I don't know where Fionn is from, but I, I'm imagining this name to be very Irish and like very IRA. Like Fionn, oh, you fucking cunt. Let's you got the Ireland British. part, right? Oh, sweet. Oh, I didn't even read that. <laughs> Greetings from Ireland. Yep. So you got your oh, my at least 50%. <laughs> I'm obsessed with Ireland. I think everything's great. Everyone's accent's great. I just love it. Love it, love it, love it. I want to like, I, I've probably seen like 
12 movies about like various IRA terrorist type shit. And it's so funny because it just don't sound like terrorists. They're like, oh, but it kills a lot of them. And I'm like, you know, I know that's a Scottish accent, but give cut me some fucking slack. And then it was just like, I'm just like, wow, I can't, I can't be offended. I can't consider them evil. Yeah. Irish are great. It was so nice when uh, Jason Finan took us around and like drove us around the whole fucking country. Practically, it was so cool getting to see it and meet some people. And it was they're they're awesome. I love. Can you imagine if if uh, Fion's uh, Fion? I don't even know how to say it. Uh, Fion, you gotta you gotta tell us how to say your name. Can you imagine if uh, Fion and Jason were brothers? His name it was Fion Finan. Whoa, that would be right? such a, an a There's literary. Probably at least one guy in Ireland named that. Mm, yeah. There was, um, I was listening to Michael Bisping's podcast the other day and they had an impersonator call in and pretend to be Conor McGregor. And he was so oh good. God. His accent was like spot on. If you, if you weren't like paying attention and you were listening, you'd be like, oh my God, is that oh, Conor shit. McGregor? He's you really funny. He cunts the love of you. <laughs> All right. Hello, my morally superior Jack friends. Greetings from Ireland. SBD1RMs, 1175 kilos, uh, 72.5 kilos, 140 kilos. Training for two years, male, 26, one. Oh, one. Okay, oh, question first one. question. I was like, what the fuck? Was that, are you telling us how many months old you are as well? That'd be so fucking <laughs> sweet. Um, I love it when my kids are really attached to their age. You're like, how old are you, buddy? Like 10 years and six months. I'm like, wow, that's really Whoa. cool. <laughs> Who's my big man? Yeah, you're definitely better than people who are any younger than you, even by months. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, <laughs> closer to death. I'm just kidding. I don't tell kids shit like that. That would be funny. Um, I started cutting for aesthetic purposes around the 1st of March at 80 kilograms at 173 centimeters. And now as of the 24th of May, 76.5 kgs, this equates to around 0.3 kgs per week, which I felt fairly uh, slow fits with my lifestyle, still living with parents, etc. I am now three days into a maintenance period that will be followed by another cut. And I'm still fairly high body fat, kind of a skinny fat looking love handle, small gut, etc. How long should my maintenance period be? Uh, well, let's see. How long was this diet? Uh, 1st of March to the 24th of May. That's like 12 weeks. Yeah. So like the, we can give you the blanket recommendation, which is usually two thirds to one times the length that you spent dieting. That's kind of a good weeks. place to start. Mm. And then after that, it's individuals, individualized concerns. Like, are you still having ravenous food cravings? Are you still dreading the next time you're, you're, you think about cutting things like that? Then you might consider going a little bit longer. If you don't have those things, then you might be good in, you know, two thirds time. And that's great. Yeah. I would say, you know, two weeks of maintenance with some good high quality, you know, I would say like the first, uh, the first month of that, you can train fucking hard and use a little rebound from cutting to gain some muscle. The second month, train more for strength with lower volume and to let your body really cool it on the volume. And then after that eight weeks, you'll probably be in your condition. Very, very good candidate for dieting again and then hit another 12 one. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Um... Number two, during my cut, while my calories are relatively high, I struggle with a kind of dizziness slash lightheadedness between meals that was distinct from hunger. Mm. I assume this is some sort of low blood sugar issue that I wasn't eating very much in the morning, especially. Is this to be expected on a cut or am I just morally weak individual? We can be both. <laughs> both. Uh, is this uh, an indicator that I should eat more carbs and less fat? No, you know what, man? Sometimes you get shit gets kind of wacky when you're cutting, man. Your body doesn't have enough food. Um, you know, I would say just, you know, check up with your doctor and make sure all your blood work is good, that you're healthy. Get a, get a, a you know, a fasting glucose test done. And because uh, that's, by the way, like it's not an extra special test. They do it every time anyway, by default. Um, and it's like super straightforward. Like you're probably fine. Uh, I just, I don't want to tell you you're fine. And they discover there's a fucking massive tumor eating your heart. <laughs> like right. Dr. Mike and Dames said that I was fine. So just go to the doctor, get, don't get it checked out. Just get it just a good physical and some just normal blood work. And you can tell the doctor, like you've been a little bit dizzy um, when you're dieting and he'll probably look at you and be like, well, yeah, sometimes that happens. Uh, so, you know, 99 uh, chance out of a hundred is totally fine. Um, and you just make sure you eat some food before you go train hard so that you don't feel like that when you're training. Yeah. And maybe consider if you've been eating more moderate to high GI carbs, maybe try and swap out for lower GI carbs and see if that makes any difference for you. Sometimes if you're just getting like a big, uh, what's it called? You get the, the post sugar crash kind of thing going on and you might be lightheaded if you had like a big bowl of cereal or something as your post-workout carbs, who knows? So I would say like that might be a good thing to try too. see if it makes a difference. If you've been doing a lot of like uh, white bread, white rice kind of stuff, switch to brown, switch to whole grains, switch to fruits, see if that makes a difference. Yeah. 
Number three, do you have a systematic way to learn to gauge RIR? I have consumed a decent amount of your material about this, and it seems that the skill is movement specific, not super exact, and you get better at it by actually going to or very close to failure. I find deciding between two to three RIR very difficult, other than assuming three RIR is moderately difficult and two RIR is a bit more difficult. Currently training push pull legs at home with 15 kilogram dumbbell gyms in Ireland open back up in August. RIP. Um, so I would say this uh, the, you, the, we have a recent YouTube video on the uh, RP Strength YouTube. A Renaissance Periodization YouTube, um, I suppose, where you watch these. <laughs> um, and uh, that video is about progression on uh, hypertrophy. And it, it literally, it's like the rep, uh, the match or beat rep system. That is the explanation, the exact best answer to your question. It's not so systematic, but it is an excellent way to learn to gauge RIR. And in many respects, dare I say, it makes precise gauging of RIR pointless, like all you got to do is shoot that two to four RIR range in microcycle one, and then you just make things a little harder, a little harder, a little harder, and then eventually you go to failure. It's inevitability. So I would check that video out as it, it really just, it's the only in week one of any hypertrophy program that you really have to do just somewhat decent job. Uh, and then you go from there. It's, uh, I, I tell you, what's the, the exact analogy that can be used. Let's say you're like a three plate eater at the buffet, like all you can eat Chinese buffet. Let's say you can eat like three plates. Like the question is like, how big should your first plate be? Like, you know what, man, like just some decent amount of food. Cause if you just really didn't get enough food, uh, you can always put more on your second plate and you'll know much better how hungry you are then. So don't take like just one slice of orange and don't put so much food on it. There's food falling off and you can't even finish it, right? That would be like going really close to failure micro one, but like just a decent amount of food. And then the second and third plate, you'll be way easier to auto-regulate because you'll know exactly and better and better and better. As you get fuller, you'll know exactly how much more food you want. thus how much more food to take. Same idea. We do a decent, roughly three hour estimate in the first microcycle, and then you just add a little rep, add a little weight, add a little rep, add a little weight, and sooner or later you will hit failure. And it'll be very uh, that whole march from roughly three RIR to zero RIR, even if it doesn't occur exactly linearly, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, very much agreed. And you know, this is one of those tough things where I wish we could just give you a very quick, straightforward, like here's a five step process to figuring out RIR. But this is ultimately kind of a trial by fire type situation where you just got to go and try. And the more experience you have, the more it'll become refined. And like Dr. Mike said, as long as you're basically in the ballpark, it really doesn't matter all that much. So uh, we get this question a lot. And I, I feel like people are so hesitant on this issue of RIR. At some point, you just got to go in there, try. Like if you start and you get, uh, if you're on a five-week meso and week one, you hit two RIR, oops, oh, well, what are you going to do next? Keep going. Just keep going. You yeah. know, and then the next time you'll figure it out a little bit better. And the next time and the next time and the next time etc. So it's just one of these things like I wish that there was just like a simple like, here's five steps to figuring out three or four RIR. Ultimately, like we can kind of walk you through it, but it doesn't matter until you go out and try. Um, this is one of those things. There's a there's a word for it. This is kind of it's not a, it's not productive procrastination. It's just one of those things where you're like trying to overly prepare for something instead of actually doing it. Yeah. I don't, there's a, there's a phrasing for that. I can't quite put my, by the way, James, it. you're currently uh, displaying your inbox. Sorry. I spaced out. Not okay. my, my work one and not my personal one. Yep. So, okay. Actually I've just edited this document to reflect my answers to the next question. And James, I would love for you to, to uh, uh, chime in because our political views are largely identical. Um, he says bonus politics question for Mike. I'm fairly sure I disagree with you on a number of issues. What books should I read to better understand your point of view? I assume Atlas Shrugged, but if you have any other recommendations, special economics, that would be great. Well, so the thing is Atlas Shrugged is a novel uh, that's written to in, incite your passions. If you already mostly agree with it. And if you don't mostly agree with it, you'll think it's fucking just awful. God awful thousand pages of bullshit. Ayn Rand insanity. Um, I happen to think that I, uh, to me, the, the book Atlas Shrugged is almost a religious book to the extent that it invokes a great deal of positive emotion uh, and negative as well in me. Uh, I'd have a tattoo of the fucking book on my shoulder, uh, but I just wouldn't exactly use that book to convince anyone of any kind of views. I would use those um, five books that I displayed right there. Uh, I think that, that these are a really good start. Skeptical Environmentalist by Bjorn Lomborg, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, The Myth of Rational Voter by Brian Kaplan, uh, The Blank Slate by Stephen Pinker, and by Pinker again, Enlightenment Now. Uh, these books, like if you 
read all of them, they, they sort of tend to blend a general consensus about how things work. Like logic is good, reason is good, science is good, capitalism works empirically and on a moral level really well. And with just a few extra special conditions and externalities, uh, fundamentally, logic, science, and freedom are the best ways to do things. Uh, and uh, I don't know, James, am I missing anything big there that you want to add as far as books? Because you've been doing a whole lot of reading lately. Yeah, actually, I made like a, a Dr. James reading list. It's on my, uh, my link tree thing in the, my Instagram. So if you go to my Instagram, there's a link tree link. And then there's one of them that says Dr. James reading list. And there's sports science stuff. There's, you know, social political stuff. There's anime, uh, manga, graphic novels, anything you think that I anything that I thought was interesting is on there. Some of it's not always a uh, What's the right word? I don't want to say politically controversial. Correct. Yeah, some of it's not always politically correct, and there's a disclaimer on there, but any of the stuff that's on there, I thought was at least thought-provoking and interesting and worth considering. Yeah, and if you want to tackle one of these uh, first uh, to really get the, the broadest understanding of my views, I would say it's between basic economics and the blank slate. Because if you read the blank slate and you look at sort of the modern SJW movement, you're going to be like, oh my God, they're factually wrong about almost everything. Uh, and you look at the modern conservative movement. I don't know if anything means everything that it does in Ireland, that it does in the United States. Right wing. And you're like, oh my God, they're wrong about almost everything. And then you see that, you know, there's a nice furry middle there that's really nice. And basic economics is like, uh, if you think you're very, very convinced that you know what's right and wrong as far as regulating big business, um, you know, antitrust law, minimum wage. Once you read basic economics, you're going to be like, God damn it, this shit is a little bit more complicated than I thought. And it turns out businessmen aren't always evil and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, it's kind of a tough thing. I, like, I, uh, I have been reading a lot and I, there's a, a bunch of books that I, that I would like to share, but mm -hmm. um, the last couple of times I posted books, people like, I got outraged and it was people kind get of really upset fucking weird. And uh, I read a really good one. Uh, I'm in the middle of uh, reading Dan Crenshaw's book. And he's a conservative. Uh, he serves in some branch of the government. Honestly, I forgot. Um, but he's a conservative guy. And he has like a really interesting story. He's a Navy SEAL. He's got like, oh, blown, mm -hmm. blown up by an IED. Yeah. And he, he, um, he's, like, he's like a Christian conservative guy. So obviously, we don't see eye to eye on quite a few things. But I thought his like story and perspective are really good. And I was going to post it on Instagram, just like, oh, hey, I read this book. And then I, but I held back because I was like, I know somebody's going to be like, look at this fitness people on the yeah. alt right. And it's like, I keep getting that. And it's like, you know, fuck you, fuck off. This is yeah. just, I, you can't win. And so I didn't. But anyways, that's another one that I read recently that yeah. I thought was interesting. The, if you guys just want a sort of quick summary of what James and I think about some of these things, uh, we think that SJWs are coming from a really good place with intention, but are often wildly misguided. Uh, they think we're evil. And we think that conservatives are often coming also from a good place, but are so wrong as to be inconsolable with any reason. So, uh, you know, that, that's the deal. So you will not see James and I get offended. We just don't get offended. Because getting offended is not something to pat yourself on the back about. Uh, you know, you can analyze issues in the world. And if you want to help a certain issue along the way, you do what's logical and reasonable and, and do good advocacy and good work. Uh, people pat themselves on the fucking back and they just love the outrage culture is something James and I have a huge fucking problem with. Like, we're outraged by it. <laughs> we're yes. not. But uh, it's just it's just sad because people are like, you're a fucking rrr, the sexist, racist, this phobe, that oh. phobe. And th those things may actually be accurate or they're not. But I usually, we usually give people the benefit of the doubt. Like, for example... If a conservative says some crazy shit, we don't just assume he's a Nazi. And if some SJW is like, the poor should have more resources. We're not like, communist, you're going to put us in fucking death camps. Like, eh, you know, we want to hear you out. Maybe you're right. So, Yeah, and just on that note, um, if you guys want a really good read on um, outrage and call-out culture, The Coddling of the American Mind by Dr. Jonathan Haidt is very good. Uh, it focuses a lot on like uh, what's going on at universities, but it's transient across other issues as well. And that's on my reading list. Super. All right. Two things I've been called independently of one another. Harry Small. <laughs> that's, that's, is that really his name? That's pretty sweet. <laughs> Harry fucking Small, isn't he? Oh, my God. So he's got to be Harrison Small, right? And then he goes by Harry. Was Harry and the Hendersons the full name uh, uh, Harrison? No. I guess not. That's true. Harry and Hendricks is fucked up because he's like a Paleolithic fucking ancestor and he's just like, could potentially be wildly violent. And, and they, the family's like, basically oppressing him at that point, right? Like he's, they're, they're not letting him be himself. Yeah, I, I guess that's probably true. I, is he free to leave the household? I wonder. It's, it's unclear. 
I think Doug and I watched Harry and the Hendersons once just to see how 90s out it was. And holy fucking shit. We were like, <laughs> good late 80s Christ. Is it just, life was just very different. They're like, it was just like, wow. Their interior decorating was like, this is the gaudiest shit I've ever seen in my life. Why would you ever make your house look like this? Oh my God. Anyway. When we were house hunting in Montana. One of the houses looked like, it looked like a place where uh, in the 90s you would go to do Coke parties. It was like- Yes. The, like, oh, 90s gaudy place we'd ever seen and we were just like oh my god this is too much can't take it love it i love it harry small says hi docs hope you're well my first question is regarding full body training splits during quarantine i've been using this approach and i've really enjoyed it and i've managed to maintain good pumps and muscle tension with as little as three or four sets per muscle group per day i was considering bringing this approach to the gym once they open back up what would be your thoughts on this i would split the volume up appropriately over the sessions a similar way to eric helms and jeff nippert and therefore would still be training with appropriate volumes between mev and mrv do you believe there are any significant drawbacks to this method if programmed appropriately, e.g. not programming heavy squatting on the same day uh, or day after heavy deadlifts? Yeah, so like that is probably like if you can, if the, if the interference effects don't get with you much, that's, that's super cool. Um, another thing is a consideration of warm-up times. Like if you train legs every day, you have to rewarm up for legs, which takes a while every day. And then you have to warm up for back and chest and arms. So sometimes clustering muscle groups together, training them two to four times a week as opposed to six uh, is uh, better because it lets you like, once you're warmed up for chest, you hammer chest a little bit harder and then you can move on to something else. So your, your total ratio of training time to warm up time over the week improves. But if those things aren't super relevant to you and you really enjoy the full body training, it does have its advantages um, just to be clear, Eric Helms and Jeff Nipper are pieces of shit. I hate them both. I disagree <laughs> with them on everything. Um, Eric Helms knows that I don't like them. It's been very clear from the start. <laughs> That's funny. That's a joke, um, by the way, yeah, I was like, he's, I was gonna, I was gonna let you say it, but I was like, he's joking. By the way, um, <laughs> the only thing that you run into too is when you do like the that frequency and that full body split. And this is this is of course me being skeptical. James is. Um, more often than not, you're just doing MEV training. You think you're doing like MAV, MRV training, and you're really not. You're just training at MEV because you can get by doing that. Once you yeah. really start pushing up to the MAV and MRV values, you find that there's just not enough recovery time when you do a lot of those full body splits. Now, in some, some situations, that's perfectly okay because like if you're cutting, really all you got to do is maintain that muscle mass, which is relatively easy to do. Um, but for other situations, you might find that that is less appropriate, like massing, especially if you're trying to... Um, put it on a lot of size all around, you'll just find that there are recovery limitations when you are pushing the boundaries. So if you're just doing like, you know, full body training every single time and you're like, oh yeah, I'm getting an okay pump. It's like, yeah, you're probably just training at MEV. You probably could do a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then he says, also I've been struggling to recover from my back training and seem to be able to recover from a lot more volume for chest. For example, 25 sets of chest, but maxing out at 16 for back. Is this usual? Or do you think it could be linked to axial fatigue reaching my MRV before local and then as a consequence interfering with a back training? So axial fatigue actually can be caused by back training, but usually doesn't affect it. It affects leg training mostly um, because that's where most of your vertical spinal loading occurs. Proper back training involves very little vertical spinal loading because you don't bent row standing up. And if you do, you're bent rowing wrong. Um, so I think that if you're training normally with lots of vertical pulling and horizontal pulling and your back MRV is what it is, then it is what it is. Um, unless you're detecting axial fatigue and the way you would detect that is your overhead presses, your squats, your front squats, your stiff legged deadlifts, your good mornings, any lifts which require your spine to be vertical and, and resist against force. If those lifts start to really take a fucking dive at the same time that your back seems like it's really limited, then maybe there's a connection. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't initially suspect that folks. Here's the thing, James and I go on these rants every now and again, but, and, and we're not attacking you by, by any, any means, Harry, just a, a bit of a, an opportunity to get some, some knowledge out folks. There's, if, your MRV is X, Y, Z. There's almost certainly nothing wrong with you. It's just a different, which is yes, really that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Damn it. You beat me to it. Yeah, I totally agree. It's just, it's, it's, it's like, so in this case, it's like, oh, my, my chest was 25 and my back was 16. So there's no value judgment for James and I to make there at all. Yeah. That's, if that's just, it, it is what it is. Maybe you are um, choosing less, making less good SFR choices for chest and really good SFR choices for back. Who knows? There's, or that's just, maybe you're doing a good, good job for both. And that's yeah. just what it is. And that's fine. Doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. Yep. Now, you could also be doing a bunch of stuff wrong, but we can't immediately tell from that that you're doing stuff wrong. There's extremes in which we would get skeptical, James. Like if you said your back M or your leg quad MRV was 40, but your forearm MRV was 10, we'd be like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but still, that could be a thing. Yeah. All right. Luke Hennigan. 
Hennig, Hennig Ham. Uh, hey, Docs, want to start off by saying I really appreciate the uh, knowledge and information you guys put out. I often find myself uh, out acknowledging my HES buddies. Awesome. What, what's HES? I don't know. I was... Health, existentialism. Health, exercise science. Stupidity. Oh, health and exercise science. Maybe. Yeah, you're right. That's really good. That's much better than my guess. After bulking for about four years. High school exchange students. <laughs> like, hey guys, I know stuff. They're like, I don't speak English. I don't like, speak ah, English. See, I know more than you about everything. The MRV, yeah. What do you think of that? Like, uh. the kid, the, the kid learns English, gets hired for like a two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year coding job. You're like, ah, I guess he was smarter than me. Fuck. <laughs> Goddamn immigrants taking her jobs. <laughs> After bulking for about four years, I am on my first cut. I am a twenty one year old male, one hundred ninety five pounds, five nine, and ten weeks into. My cut, uh, having lost 10 pounds. Oh, he bulked for yep. four years. My man. My dog. I've been lifting for six years, four of which have been somewhat intelligent. <laughs> My ratio is not nearly as great as yours. <laughs> My goal is to be somewhat lean before putting on more size. I'm thinking that will be somewhere around 180 to 185. Just a quick reminder, you don't know where exactly that's going to be. It's fine to have a goal and thinking, but you may be leaner much earlier than that or much later, so keep an open mind. My program is legs, chest, Back, uh, oh, legs, chest, and back, arms, repeat, off. I have, okay, so push, pull, le- oh, no, uh, upper, lower, and arms. Cool. Um, I have cut my volume from 18 sets per week per muscle to 12 sets per week per muscle. I noticed I have to deal it every fourth week as opposed to every sixth. Oh, this is during cutting. Got it. I'm still learning how much to cut back on volume as this is my first time cutting. I am beginning to question all of my lifting decisions. This week was fresh off of a deload. I noticed my bench is starting to slip. I am usually able to get 255 for 3 by 9 and a 7 to 9 RP. The plan this week was to get 3 by 10 if possible. However, I was only able to get 255 for 2 by 8 and 235 for 1 by 8. At all RP 9 to 10, this kind of freaked me out because I'm fresh off a deload and my other lifts are going well. I'm still hitting PRs on them. Is this something I need to worry about? Any volume recommendations for cutting? So our volume recommendations for cutting are to go between your MEV and your MRV. And we don't know what that is. Only you do. So make sure you're getting good pumps and getting good heart training and you should be fine. Uh, and then look, bench press takes a fucking huge hit when you're cutting. It does that for almost everyone. So just yeah. remember that. It always comes back. So I wouldn't sweat that a ton. But yeah, you maybe uh, just make sure you're getting good hard workouts and g- generally recovering from them. And you're doing the best you can. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, don't sweat the bench too much just because it's, it's like a guarantee. Like, I remember uh, back in some of the early days of RP when we were really working with a lot of the strength sport athletes, they were like, I want to be able to cut and not lose anything on my bench. And it was kind of like a, we always have to just tell them ahead of time, like, look, if, you're, if, you're, if you lose you know, 10 kilos, it's very likely that your bench is going to go down a little bit. Not like it's not going to be horrible, but it's going to go down a little bit. It's just normal, especially even for powerlifting, even more because you're just losing size uh, mass from your body. Now you can actually go lower on your touch, right? Unless you've got a big belly bench going. So uh, don't sweat it. It seems like it's um, kind of still within the operational range for you. I don't, you know, if your other lifts are good, then meh. Yeah. If you had other lifts that were suffering, like if your squat or your, you know, back stuff was also going down, I'd be a little bit more like, ooh, yeah, sounds like maybe you got to go tweak a few things. But if it's just one lift and it's the bench. Totes. Harrison Caton says, hello, doctors, Michael James. I haven't posted in a while. It's going to be back now for some questions. Number one, I took about four weeks off training after what was the most stressful period of uh, time in my life to date. Pretty much, I lost all appetite for food. I went from massing to barely being able to eat a normal meal without nausea during the first few days. I lost all appetite for training. I had trouble sleeping through the night, and I would wake up at 1.30 or 2 after going to bed at 10 or 11. It took about two weeks before I slept eight hours straight. Now things have finally resolved, and I've gotten back to a new normal. Would you have suggested something different than a wholesale break from training, given a large amount of home stress? Uh, well, you know, if you got a time machine, uh, and I'm just kidding, I think uh, when shit really, really hits the fan, it'll taking some time off of training is totally fine. Yeah. You know, like it, if possible, we would say you want to do maintenance training, but Two sessions a week, yeah. compound lifts, five to 10 reps, yeah. but it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I have bigger fish to fry. I have bigger priorities in my life right now. Something's got to go. If it's lifting. Oh, well, you know, you can make those decisions. And if, when you make the decision, you should do it definitively and firmly and, and understand that you have trade-offs to make. And that's, this is a trade-off. It's temporary and it's, it's for the better. And that's perfectly fine. Going back in time, I would say try and get two days a week MVs, like not much. It's like two sets per muscle group per session. Mm-hmm. Um, but you did what you had to do and that's probably, you probably are better for it. So no worries. 
All right. Make Number sure you ease back in now that you're getting back to yeah, normal. I think he might be asking that next. What are recommendations for beginning training? Slash what was dumb. I'm about to start Juggernaut AI Power Building 2.0 program, starting with a four-week bridge block. This will be Sunday, May 31st. What I've done so far is just, well, we're too late. Uh, what I've done so far is just go in and not follow a plan, but do what feels fun. Saturday, May 23rd was my first day back. I maxed out on Snatch. That was a stupid fucking oh, idea. No. And I had a five-pound PR of 210. Sunday, because I didn't film Saturday's PR, I maxed out again on Snatch and hit 215. Bro, what are you right doing? Here. You're Monday, doing... I PR my front squat by 30 pounds. Stupid, stupid oh, idea. No. 365, and this caused my hamstring to feel a bit off. Wait a minute. Now, how does that make any sense? Oh, Maxing out when you first came back at your hurt. Not, not just once, but several times. Uh, Tuesday, I bench four by 10 with 135 with a flat back versus arched, feet up, slow eccentric with a pause. Surprisingly, as my bench max is 380, this was more difficult than I thought. It has given me some really good doms. Mm, yeah, it's because you're detrained. Then on each of these days, there was a longer warm-up routine followed by a few accessories. Um, what are recommendations for getting training or what was dumb? Uh, you started way too hard and it cost you a hamstring injury. Uh, come back super easy, light weights, very few sets, very few reps. The next half week, increase all that. The next half week, increase all that. The next half, super slow. It should take you a month to ramp up back to normal training volumes and loads and any strength you gained or maintained or retained won't be affected by this process. It's all, all good. Huge chance of injury is coming back strong. You did what I would describe as just one technique shy of trying your best to get hurt. I would add one more thing there. I would say smash your shit with like eight sets of squats for tens and then try to max out on the snatch right after that. That would be the only thing. I would say would increase your injury risk more than you did. So you definitely screwed the pooch on that one. No big deal. James and I have done way worse with ourselves, but that's what the question you asked. Yeah. And so I would also go ahead and get back on some kind of a regimen. Like I know you're just kind of going by feel for now and that's okay. But um, the, the, the point of getting back to normal is also getting into a routine of some sort, right? So I would say, don't just, don't just train uh, intuitively or by field. Go ahead and get back on like a, you know, whatever it is, like a four or five day program where you say, okay, Monday's bench, Tuesday's squat, whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Get back into a routine and kind of start getting a feel for what your old training used to be at, like Dr. Mike said, much reduced volumes and intensities than it was before. And you're going to slowly work your way back up. The, the thing is, it's like you're not doing yourself any favors if you spend this time kind of for more lack of a better phrase, and just fucking around. And then you start the juggernaut you know, program, which is a very good program. And you're basically still not prepared because you've been doing unregimented training yeah. the whole time. And so possibly then you just, injured. Then you, then you just fucked, you just fucked again for no reason. So I would say, don't do it intuitively. Go ahead and get yourself in a routine like you normally would. And then when you transition into the harder training program, it won't be quite as abrupt for you. So, Boom. With the new power building program, my comp bench press is based on my own arm percentage. I know that for the best hypertrophic response, exercises should be done with a slow eccentric full range of motion and a small pause. When it comes to my comp bench press, should I A, do them normally, first rep paused and the rest touch and go with competition arch, and do my accessories like dumbbell bench press and flies with all the range of motion and timing stuff, or B, lower the weight, do all of the slow eccentric full ROM and paused. Well, so you're doing a power building program, which means you should do them actually normally would be first rep, second rep, third rep, et cetera, paused. I would uh, just not do competition bench for a minute. Yeah, well, so he's doing the power lifting program, power building program. You might not want to do that. So return to fitness first. Yes. But if you do a power lifting program, the Juggernaut AI one is a great, great program. I would, when, I, when you do your competition bench, I would just do every rep paused. So, yeah. If, 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 you were, if, if you were somebody that I was working with, we would be doing return to fitness, maybe some dumbbell work, maybe just some like push ups, just to kind of get you back into the group, <clears throat> moving into yeah. the more stressful. Like, the last thing I would do for somebody like you is put them into their competition lifts, uh, maybe just for technique purposes, but not for training purposes. Yeah, 100%. Number four, similarly for squats, should I do them full ROM, slow eccentric, and paused, or use belt squat and hack squat to do that? Well, so if you're, again, if you're doing a power building program, you got to do your squats. Uh, if it probably says, if it says competition squats, you do them like you do in competition. If the exercise just says squat, then you can do it high bar, normal. Uh, and then if you got the, all the other... Now, when you do use the machines, if it says belt squat or hack squat, then you do do them just like you described. You know? 
Yeah, I think the belt squat is perfectly fine, but if your goal is to get back into powerlifting, I would probably choose a barbell squat variation or a hack squat. And then if you have accessory days, the belt squat might be okay. But again, like ease into these things. Uh, and I certainly, like, again, I'm, try- I'm beating the dead horse here, but I certainly wouldn't start you doing low bar squats. I would say, why don't we get going on some high bar and then work our way to low bar in, a- in the next couple months. Number five, Tuesday, my mid-back felt a little off, probably from maxing out too much. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> and I decided to use flexion rows and the back extension machine to get some blood in the back. What are your thoughts about using a back extension machine? Ugh. I'm thinking of the one where you have a handle in front of you and you pull back on those handles to move the weight stack. Should this exercise be done where you arch your back at the top and really try oh, to Oh, it's the actual machine. I thought he meant a 45 degree backwards. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think it's a fine machine. Just do it uh, slow and controlled and have a real distinct uh, maximum arch position and really round your back at the bottom. And I think you're totally fine. I personally Again, have very little of it. <laughs> I, yeah, I found this is just me personally. I found that machine to be largely useless. I don't have a, an objection as, as an exercise and I don't have any objection to it. I just, it's like, um, it's the same way I feel about the reverse hyper where it just like, it just doesn't. Yeah. Like who the fuck knows what it's for? What do you do this? Why are we doing this? Uh, flexion rows are better. <laughs> flexion, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Six. I compete with a sumo deadlift. Do you see any utility of doing sumo deadlift for hypertrophy of the hips? No, because the hips are bones. Uh, I'm fucking with you. It's actually true. The hips are on bones. But yes, the hip musculature is absolutely sumo deadlift, especially deadlift uh, from a deficit is excellent for hypertrophy of the glutes and the adductors and so on and so forth. Context, I did halting deadlifts for sixes, 12 if you count the partial pulls as a rep. I felt a tremendous burn in my hips and glutes and thought sumo deadlifts might be useful in hypertrophy there. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you mean by hips, but glutes, yes. And if you mean by hips, your adductor complex, then yeah, totally. And honestly, like, again, I'm saying the same point over and over again, I would maybe start with a variant of a deadlift, maybe like a stiff-legged deadlift or something where the loading isn't quite as high and the strain is not quite as high. Uh, I think going into the competition-style lifts right off the bat would be a bad move. Yeah. You're very yeah, even if yeah. even if you did a little return to fitness, your work capacity is going to be in the toilet for a little while. And moving into those those movements like the comp bench, the the low bar squat, the sumo deadlift, your systemic work capacity is just going to be in the toilet for a little while, and you're just going to overreach prematurely all the time. And it's going to suck. Yeah. Number seven, I've decided against doing USAPL Raw Nationals this year and want to focus on body composition. I related a lot to Brandon Armstrong's question last week about priority has body composition versus competition experience. Mm. At this time, I'm tired of not having abs and have been massing on and off for three years without any fat loss phases because of uh, My man. this. Here's a general plan that I'd come up with to hopefully prepare me for USAPL Raw Nationals 2021. It's far away. Let's find out. Four-week bridge blocks GPP maintenance, uh, starting body weight 86. Ten weeks of hypertrophy on a fat loss diet, gold body weight 80. Should my rate of loss be less or more? Um, looks fine. Probably pretty aggressive. I'd say less. My body fat, I guess, is around 18, 22%. I'm 5'11". Probably a little bit less. Four-week strength block, maintenance diet, body weight 80. I want to avoid adaptive resistance, but we're going to mass. Is this turnaround long enough? Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, 11 weeks of hypertrophy, massing diet, goal body weight 84, plus 0.35 kilograms per week. Totally fine. Uh... Is this a good middle ground? Yep, totally. And just just for the rate stuff, like this is stuff that we'd have to calculate in terms of rate of gain or loss. Check out RP Diet 2.0 for all that yep. stuff. Yep. Four week strength block, maintenance diet. Uh, any tips for maintenance during the holidays? Don't be a fat piece of shit, but enjoy food and you'll be fine. Yeah. Stay active. If you want to eat a little bit more, like keep on your feet, do yep. some extra cardio, some extra work or whatever you got to do. Don't, just don't sit on the couch and pound that fucking stuffing. Yeah. Four weeks strength block and then 15 weeks of hypertrophy. I would like to see a mini cut after that four week strength block because you did 11 weeks of hypertrophy and then another 15 weeks of hypertrophy with no cutting. Um, gee whiz, you're going to get real fat. And like the strength block is, I mean, it's definitely lower volume, but it's still like a very – Hard, it's still very hard training. So I, I agree. I think the mini cut would, would be beneficial from a training standpoint too. Yeah. Uh, and he says, this is pushing it in terms of massing length. Yes, it is. I've heard from RP podcast, the idea of one week deload dieting where you take one week off and do maintenance after four or five weeks of steady dieting. 
would it be worth my time to try that or just stick to 15 weeks? Uh, you just got to play it by ear at that point. It's a judgment call. 13 weeks of strength and a peaking of the pilot to competition at the end. Uh, maintenance diets, etc. cetera. So 13 weeks is a decent enough length of time to actualize my gains in muscle. Yes, but maybe not after gaining that much muscle. I would prefer to see... Uh, yeah, you should be fine. So you have like two strength blocks. Each one's eight weeks. Uh, and then you have another five weeks left for peaking. Yeah, that should be fine. And then he says 10 weeks of further strength into peaking with potential raw nationals 2021. Um, plan to start taking creatine out of hydrate next week. Is there any problems that you know for taking it for multiple years? No. Also, would you consider coming off it around competitions to lower how much water you're storing? Yeah, if you want to lose strength too. So no, I wouldn't do that. Um, yeah, that seems like a fine plan. Just reconsider that 11 weeks massing, four weeks strength block, 15 weeks hypertrophy. I would just say 11 weeks of hypertrophy and then a four or five week mini cut one or two weeks of deload slash active rest and then go into uh, hypertrophy again for 15 weeks or maybe even less, like 12. Generally speaking, when we mass within a single macro cycle, the earlier massing phases are, are longer than the later ones, right? So you want 11 weeks of hypertrophy and then 15 weeks after, I would like to see you flip those two and have a mini cut in between. James agreed? Yeah. Because cool. it's like you get less and less out of it as you do it, so you shouldn't do it for a longer time. You just get really fat. Eight, one of the areas of growth I'm focused on of hypertrophy uh, time is my shoulders. Are they a really weak point in the bench? I saw a video from Maddie Rogers about learning how to do handstand and eventually learning how to walk in your hands. Would you see this as a fun way to build shoulder strength? No. Not for powerlifting. Yeah. It's a cool technique to use your existing shoulder strength to do cool stuff. I would say it's a highly inefficient way to build shoulder strength. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's just a, a gymnastics thing at that point. It's just learning how to do it. Uh, I think that would be a huge waste of your time and possibly counterproductive. Possibly injurious. Yeah. Number nine, lastly, I'm vacationing in Montana in early to mid-July. I heard on beers with Chad that Dr. James are moving to Missoula area soon. Yeah. Any like possibility that you'd be moved winter. in there by then and I'd be able to take you out for coffee and a blowjob. I give amazing ah. blowjobs. Seriously, I'll suck out all of Holy shit, Harrison. What the fuck? Sold. Um, Sold to the man giving blowjobs. Yeah. Also, in Missoula, there's a restaurant called Cafe Dolce. I've heard it's very good. Just passing that recommendation. Thanks, Amelia and Harrison. Tom. Thanks, Harrison. Uh, I don't think I'll be moved. I don't think it'll, it'll work out timeline-wise because I will not be fully moved in until basically July. I'm at like one-third of the way there. And then midway through this month, we were doing it like two-thirds. And then at the end of the month, we're doing the last third. And then my wife has invited all of america to stay at our house during that time uh so unfortunately i don't think the timeline will work out but i really appreciate it and i definitely appreciate the uh, recommendation on the cafe and maybe we can meet up another time i can't wait till you go there and there's another uh, web and i really like harrison cafe dolce sucks you fucking <laughs> asshole. how many times has that happened to us specifically where oh somebody's like oh you're gonna be over there try this place we go there sucks and we're like mm, why harrison we we're not saying your place is gonna suck but we're not saying it's not gonna suck <laughs> We get that. We get that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Excellent questions, Harrison. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, really good. Them. All right. Jack Natovich, the natty professor, the natty king, the nattiest man of all time. The son of the natural. I heard that when Jack Natovich stands next to like a Bulgarian juiced up Olympians, they are able to pass drug tests. I feel like this is like a, like a Chuck Norris type joke situation here. 100%. <laughs> Chuck Norris drank a bottle of liquid D ball. And then when they did blood tests, he had none in it because he shook Jack Natovich's hand. <laughs> we could go. This is like definitely meme, meme worthy <sighs> stuff. Hey docs, hope all is well or as well as it can be right now with you guys. I'm a weightlifter, but since I don't have access to barbell right now and likely won't for a while, I purchased the gym free templates to maintain some muscle and have some structure training to do. I have a set of 30 pound dumbbells and shopping bags that I fill with cans for small exercises like lateral raises. Some of my exercises in the template are sumo squats slash deadlifts. I have great squat depth and technique, not to brag. When my feet are around shoulder width apart, if I go even a little wider, um, even with no weight, I can't even hit parallel. All I feel is discomfort in my groin area and not in Ooh. a hot way <laughs> and nothing in any muscle. I've tried to address this, but it seems like sumo squatting and deadlifting just isn't in the cards for me. Totally fine, dude. It's not for a lot of people, including myself. Yeah, totally. Is it okay to switch the sumo exercises out for other exercises from the twice daily at home training PDF, yes, absolutely. Oh yeah, I better hit the target muscle and cause me less discomfort while maintaining the amount of variation of the program. So that is actually an answer that is correct for every single hypertrophy program I'll ever do. There yeah. is never a marriage to a single exercise ever, ever, ever. Yeah, don't sweat that at all. 
So my quad exercises are normal goblet squats and single shoulder rack squats. Would it be enough variation to do goblet squats and normal shoulder rack squats? Or should I also add a greater heel elevation or narrow stance? You can add those things if you feel like you need the variation. If your stimulus to fatigue ratio is meh, if shit is getting really stale, add some variation, but you absolutely don't need it. And it also might be good from a loading standpoint where I'm sure you're, you got some pretty strong legs as a weightlifter. So adding that super heel and the narrow stance might just be better for you to maintain more a challenging. more challenging yep. load. My glute exercises are sumo deadlifts and glute bridges. Can I replace the sumo deadlifts with walking lunges? Uh, yes. Sure. Or is there a better non-sumo exercise, glute exercise that I can do? I mean, I don't know. Regular deadlifts with the 30-pound dumbbells. God knows how many of those will do. Um, I can do stiff-legged sumos just fine. Oh, cool. So hamstrings aren't an issue. Very cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally fine. Or you could do like one-legged, single-leg, uh, stiff-legged deadlift, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to mix it up. Mix it up. I was going to say you could do like a... Snatch grip pulls, but then I, I was like, oh, yeah, it doesn't even have a barbell. Never mind. Right. Pretend they're snatch grip pulls by using your triceps to really <laughs> just hold the dumbbells out as far as you hold can. The dumbbells out. <laughs> That's like was a fundamental misloading. You know, like you think you're training this muscle. You are not. No. <laughs> Matthew Pearsall says, I lift in the morning about 60 minutes after getting up and after drinking a protein shake with some fast digestion carbs. Swear I'm entering a cut and wonder whether it makes sense to cut that pre-workout carbs or save calories for later in the day. My workout lasts about one hour. I don't want to get hurt my performance, but spending the carbs pre-workout may make it harder to stay at my daily caloric target later. So it's really just a matter of trade-offs, right? Why don't you try this? Cut your carbs in half uh, and see how it affects your performance. If your performance is fucking grand, then great. You just got half carbs. And then later, as you get really, really hungry at night uh, and you want to cut more food out, you can cut all the carbs out and see how your performance goes. If your performance goes straight to shit, put the carbs back in. If it doesn't and everything is hunky dory, then you're good. I personally, even when I'm massing often don't have pre-workout carbs because as long as my glycogen is loaded from the day before, my workouts are fucking phenomenal. And as a matter of fact, today I did a leg workout. Um, and when we do high volume legs, I literally, especially when I'm massing and I'm currently sort of like massing just a little bit, mostly maintaining. Um, I actually can't eat anything before a leg workout, like last time I did legs, I had a protein shake and I had, I was dry heaving. So I just had like decaf coffee and water and that's all I had. And I didn't throw up. So it was sweet, but like my leg workouts, like no problem with energy. So as long as your glycogen was loaded, you're fucking golden. Yeah, I agree. And I actually have the same kind of training schedule as you, Matt. I usually wake up and then train about an hour later after I have a, uh, you know, do some emails same and some yep. energy drink. And I never eat anything beforehand just because uh, like Mike said, like if, as long as I ate well the day before, I'll see no differences in the morning, whether I have pre or not. And I'd rather have that food later in the day when I'm more prone to being hungry. So it's just a personal choice and a matter of trade offs so in terms of performance, hunger, satiety, things like that. Yeah. Woo, man, that was a lot of questions. All right. Let me screen share and we'll get into yeah. the, uh, Oh, come on, there we go. And screen share. Zoom. Z -z 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 -zoom. Fix this. You're a fat cunt. That you could be this lean asshole. <laughs> Athlean X. All right. Let's pick a question. Mantas Pili Hudis, who's <laughs> almost <laughs> certainly. Oh my goodness. Either from Latvia or from Lithuania. Uh, let us know where you're from. How important are abs and calves in the broad jump? Would it be a good idea to never train those muscles directly? Is it okay to train different types of activities and force velocity spectrum in the same... Oh, oh, oh those are two different questions. Okay. Uh, how important are abs and calves in the broad jump? James, was my, my guess is that, uh, almost complete. They're not trainable with weights in a way that uh, actively is a limiting factor. And I think that training hip extension exercises and knee extension is way better. So uh, squats and second poles and all this stuff, right? Yeah, I would say like the abs is really a non-issue that you, whatever trunk component you'd need, you'd get from practicing. And then calves maybe like if you have weak calves, it's just going to contribute to a less forceful triple extension. But again, if you're training broad jumps, I think you get that. And if you're doing like, you know, any kind of triple extension movement in your training, like a clean pole or anything like that, you're probably good. Um, all right, let's answer a couple more of these questions. Is it okay to train different types of activities on force velocity spectrum in the same session? I've been following a similar program in Texas method on Wednesday. I do five by five or some broad jump variation, power clean variation and squat variation. I have light days on Friday on Sunday. I do sets of five of the same lifts, gradually lower the reps and increase the sets when progressing in the mesocycle. Interesting. Would it be a better idea to not do all of the sets with the same reps? 
try to adjust the reps to hit some same RIR in the session, James? It's perfectly okay to have uh, like different activities of different force velocity characteristics on the same day, so long as you're ordering them properly. So typically what we, and I actually have a lecture series uh, on RP plus uh, basics of strength and conditioning. And one of the videos, I don't remember which number it is, but deals with this directly. So in terms of exercise order, you typically are going to go for your highest velocity things first, move your way in down into like power type activities, move your way down into strength activities, move your way down into like, you know, hypertrophy, endurance, work capacity type activities, and so on down the line. So usually you want to do your most explosive and fastest moving things first and kind of work your way down. Those are going to be the most sensitive to fatigue. Um, but yeah, you don't have to separate them. It's not a terrible idea to have them separated, but you're also going to make it needlessly complicated. So if you're training like a sprint or a jump, you can absolutely do a heavy squat at that same day. The only problem is when you started to run into uh, increasingly less congruent goals, where if you're doing like um, jumps and then you're trying to do hypertrophy squats, it's like, okay, well, why are you doing those in the same mesocycle anyway? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, but generally, if you're doing something like strength and hypertrophy, if they're kind of like one rep range removed, it's not a huge deal at all. I wish you were more than one rep range removed from me. James. Oh, damn. That one hurts. That was a deep cut. <laughs> Jake Isaac says, hey, docs, when in a hypocaloric phase, are there any changes to how athletes should progress in a mesocycle in terms of increasing load and or reps? Love the webinars, by the way. So I think that you have to understand that load progression or rep progression is essentially just roughly targeting a zero or one progression in RIR. So you start RIR three, next week should be either RIR three or RIR two. The week after that should be either RIR two or RIR one, and so on and so on and so on until you get, you know, 48 weeks later, you reach RIR zero and you deload. So the real question is how, how is your performance going to be over the course of a cut? Cuts are two things. One, inherently more fatiguing because you're in a chronic hypochloric state and incrementally more fatiguing because you usually your calories get cut even more as you go through. So the real answer there is you probably won't see your abilities progress as much during the cut. So if you want your cut to last as long, that is going from three RIR to zero RIR to last as long, you basically are going to have to make smaller jumps, whether you usually add two reps and that means adding one rep or usually add five pounds and that means adding two and a half. It's probably going to be the thing. Now you can auto-regulate all of this stuff you can say like, okay, I did 10 reps in the squat last time. I want to do 10 reps again this time and still have another couple of weeks left in the tank. I want to hit like roughly two RIR based on how I felt last time and based on how I feel this time. I'm kind of tired. I'm kind of hungry. Should I do 10 pounds one last time or five? And most people that are not fucking insane are going to be like, you know what? I'm going to air on the side of five, right? So like technically adding any weight over the course of a cut is really, really good. Um, and it just air on the side of less is, is our only thing. Uh, and that's going to apply to sets as well in case you're curious. Yeah, I was just going to touch on the sets thing too. So during a cut, the, the main difference is that your MEV and MRV window is smaller. Uh, so you start start slightly more aggressively than you normally would and you end slightly less aggressively than you normally would. Uh, and so there's, we have a whole bunch of stuff in how much should I train specifically on the differences in how you would approach a cut versus other situations. Yeah. 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 yeah oh, yeah. Um, all right. Last question here. Synergy training. Do you think leg extensions are a useful move for a power lifter during a hypertrophy meso, or is it better to exclusively use compound movements to target the quads? I feel like I can get more total quad sets per week if I include leg extensions, as they are much less fatiguing systemically than compound movements. Uh, and obviously, you're not hitting glutes, hams, et cetera. But if, I'm not sure if the stimulus and carry over to squats makes them worth the extra fatigue. My answer to this would be like if you really get a lot of leg extensions, like you seem to, and like James seems to then you can include them in the very early hypertrophy phases of powerlifting, but I wouldn't expect them to transfer very quickly. So it's something I would do for the first month of a three month hypertrophy plan. And then a second month, I would switch to more compound movements. And even if you do it for two months straight, maybe don't do it for three. In addition, it shouldn't comprise the vast majority of your extra quad volume. So don't just squat, do leg extensions, squat, do plenty of hack squats, leg presses, and just a little bit of leg extending can be included. That's for people that really get a lot of leg extension. If you don't get a lot of leg extension, there's really no good reason to use it because as far as transfer is concerned, it's a very, very poor transfer. So if that poor transfer is to be justified, it has to be justified with a very high stimulus to fatigue ratio. And if you get that out of leg press or leg extension, great. You can use it a little bit. If you don't, then really there's no good use uh, for that. 
Yeah, and, and I was you made a good point there. Uh, even if you are responsive to the knee extension, you still want to bias your quad volume towards the other movements like the squats and stuff. And if you have a little bit left in the tank, then you can certainly use and benefit from those knee extensions. But what would be a mistake is if you had, let's say, you started with three sets of squats and three sets of knee extensions. If you started biasing your progressions in volume towards the knee extension instead of towards the squats, that would be like a pretty clear mistake for powerlifting specifically. You would want to start increasing your squats. And basically when you can't really do much more squatting, then you would start increasing your leg extensions further. 100%. 100%. Are we no, done? you no can have. Um, all right. Yeah, we're done, James. That's it. Holy schmauzow. That was a lot this week. All right, folks, we had great questions from RP plus. We had great questions from YouTube. Thanks so much for engaging with us. Make sure you guys subscribe to the RP uh, YouTube channel and just, uh, any of the RP stuff in general, Mike, you got anything on our way out here? Any I'm about to go do cardio and I'm pretty sure there's protesting in my neighborhood today. So wish me Godspeed. Mm, it'll give you it'll help you get your heart rate up a little bit <laughs> ah, uh, i got cardio or running yeah both um i got nothing so i think we're going to wrap this one up folks thanks for engaging with us and we will talk to you next time